fasting can be beneficial in in cancer because you're not you're not bringing in glucose you're also not bringing glutamine you make some glucose you make some glutamine so this is not a perfect situation but you are severely limiting the 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 food supply for these things and as a result you know people are doing better and that's obviously what we want hello and welcome to rugga matrix america coach talk we have an unbelievable guest today we have Dr. Anthony Chafee. He's actually a hero of mine because I had allowed myself to get pretty obese, if you could, uh, to put it mildly. If you kick me down the street, I would be rolling for about four miles. I was so fat. But I chose to change my lifestyle, especially after being um, injured pretty badly and uh and paralyzed for a little while and then needing to get myself back in the in the shape and what i started doing was eating what a keto diet then i would start eating something called keto vor which is like a little bit stricter of a keto diet and then a few months ago i decided to try a carnivore diet which is basically meat and salt and water and i'll tell you I've never felt better in my life, and a lot of my friends have, have espoused this and told me to do it, and and I always believed in it, and I always and I I read the I read the Atkins diet thing, and I and it made sense, and but there's a couple of things about uh, seed oils and things that Anthony's going to get into, but we're going to talk today primarily about how you can eat low carb and still have high performance sport, and and particularly carnivore. But we can talk about low carb and, and why low carbohydrate diets are very good. And it, low carbohydrate diets are very good for athletes. You could see me, high carbohydrate, moving to low carbohydrate, and you're built like this. You can see Anthony, low carbohydrate diet, lifting what he lifted. He probably worked out more in the last 24 hours than I worked out in the last <laughs> eight or nine years. So let's just say we're going to listen to him. And we're not going to listen to me, but I will ask the questions. Dr. Anthony Chafee actually is a very highly accomplished rugby player. He was uh, he was a tourist with the 1998 U19 team that went to New Zealand with Tony Smith and Mike Tolkien. There, he he played up in Seattle. He played in the British Columbia League and the U.S. Super League. He played for back for three years. Went over to the Royal College of Surgeons. Was also playing over in England in the uh, Champions League, the National One at the time but it was the uh, division below the premiership. And he was playing with Tony Smith over in Trinity, but that was a little bit more difficult because he was also in medical school. And now he is studying his residency in Australia to be a neurosurgeon. And I am so happy that Joe Rizzoni gave me the, uh, the contact for Dr. Anthony Chafee and we are going to speak about all things carnivore. And the first question I'm going to, I'm going to welcome you to the show, but the first question I want to ask you, because it's an amazing answer is how did you come to being a carnivore? Because it's a great story and a great speech that you gave at, at the low carb down under conference. Welcome. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, so I, I started on a carnivore diet, uh, probably around the year 2000, so around 23 years ago now, when I was playing up with Seattle, and uh, and for University of Washington. So I was I was playing for both teams at the time, and I was taking cancer biology at the University of Washington. Um, we were going over all the different sorts of things that can cause cancer, all the different sorts of places you'll find carcinogens. And, and a major one was in the food that we eat, and in particular, the produce that we eat, the different plants and vegetables and even fruits that, that we eat and mushrooms. And so we sort of knew this biologically. I mean, I remember learning in the seventh grade that plants and animals are in an evolutionary arms race. Plants becoming more and more poisonous, so less and less animals can eat them so they can survive and thrive, and that's how they survive in the wild. All living organisms have a defense mechanism, right? So animals can run away, they can fight back, they can hide. Uh, plants can't, they're stationary, so they need other means, and one of those most effective means is, is by actually being poisonous or making defense chemicals that can disrupt the animal in some way and, and deter it from eating them or even kill them if they try to eat them. You know, we know this intuitively. You get lost in the woods, you can't eat 
any random plant if you run out of food, right? Most plants will make you very, very sick or even kill you. And that's because most plants are what we call inedible plants. Why are they inedible? Because they're toxic. They make these toxic poisons. But that doesn't mean that the plants that are edible are completely benign. They don't have any toxins. They do have toxins. We just have, we, we have more of an ability to break down these defense chemicals and, and weather the storm. So we were going over all of this again, uh, but we were going at it from a cancer perspective, looking at the different carcinogens. And, and we were taught 23 years ago that just Brussels sprouts alone had over, oh, had 136 known human carcinogens in them. And that mushrooms had over 100. And then spinach, kale, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, broccoli, you name it. Any plant that you've ever eaten or any ever seen at the store, we were given lists of how many carcinogens there were in them at, at, known at the time. Uh, and there were dozens, dozens and dozens in each and every one. There wasn't a single one under 60. So that was quite shocking. We were all very, very taken aback by that. I remember looking around wildly. We were all looking around wildly, thrashing around, looking like trying to find the TA sitting in the corner, like laughing or something like that, you know, in, in on the joke. But there wasn't anyone. And so it finally dawned on us that like, okay, this guy is serious. And in my head, I remember thinking, well, but but vegetables are still good for you though, right? Because this has been drilled into our heads our entire lives. And he just sort of gave us a funny look. He must've just read our minds because he looked at us and he said, yeah, I don't, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. So in my head, I was like, right, <laughs> forget plants. I'm just not going to eat these stupid things again. I went to the grocery store after that and just was walking around the aisles. And I'm like, what in God's name do I eat? Because everything has plants in it. Everything's plants. Or it is plants or made with plants. And so I was just walking around. And I finally came around some eggs. And I was like, okay, eggs. Eggs don't come from a plant. I guess I'll get some eggs. And I came by the meat aisle and just grabbed some meat. I'm like, okay, meat doesn't come from, from plants either. So that was it. I defaulted into a carnivore diet just simply because I didn't want to eat plants. So what, what else is there to eat? So it was uh, plants or fungus, I should say. And, and so I just defaulted into a carnivore diet. And I didn't really know how significant it was. I didn't actually think about this from a biological perspective that humans actually are carnivores. That's just the kind of animal we are. We've been apex predators for about 2 million years. That's what the, all the best evidence shows. And predominantly we have eaten meat uh, prehistorically and historically. Generally people that are unable to get an adequate amount of meat are the ones that are eating plants. That's where uh, people with agriculture you know, came from. They were just sort of eating more plants because they had to. Um, and so I started just eating meat and, I, and my athletic performance just took off to all new heights. And I was playing in the, the BC Premiership with Seattle uh, Saracens, uh, now the Seattle Seawolves, right there. And, um, and then we were playing in, in you know, the US leagues as well, and then playing Super League as well, playing sevens. So doing all that and, and, and playing for University of Washington at the same time. And my, my fitness and athletic performance absolutely just, just skyrocketed after that. I, I, I took it to absolutely new levels. I was able to just push myself so hard to the point that I got so fit that I, I literally couldn't run out of energy. I was at a dead sprint every practice, every game. And I just couldn't wear myself out. I couldn't get tired. And I'd never experienced anything like that uh, before or since until now. So when I was 25, I was playing in England. And I sort of slipped off of it at that point. Sort of unbeknownst to me, I, I didn't really think about it too much apart from, uh, you know, still being very focused on meat, but some of the meat was breaded or had some crumbing on it. And it was just m much more convenient to get it like that, where it was already pre-cooked. And so I remember thinking to myself, well, you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal. Dose makes the poison. It's only a little bit, you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal. But I do remember a few months into uh, my time there thinking to myself, you know, it was getting bit more nagging injuries. I was uh, just not feeling as fit, just not feeling as sharp. And I remember thinking to myself, like, why don't I feel as just superhuman amazing as I normally do? Am I not pushing myself? Am I not working as hard? Am I, I'm 25 now. Is that it? I'm, I'm over the hill. I'm just, just, just downhill from here. My body's just going to deteriorate. And, you know, I didn't, didn't think of it at the time, but that, that, that coincided with exactly when I started just, I mean, literally just some, some crumbing on chicken and that was it. And the rest of it was whole meat. So that little bit made a massive difference.
and impact in my health and my performance. And the biggest thing, the biggest impact that it made was that I wasn't very stark, like I will not eat plants. Nothing with plants is, is going to be in my diet. Uh, it's sort of little things started slipping back in and I ended up going back to really a whole food diet, mostly meat based, but I would still have some salad or some, you know, some bread or something like that. Uh, but still very, you know, whole foods. I always really cooked for myself and, and I sort of slipped off of it. And so I never had that same level of fitness and ability that I had in my early twenties. And, you know, you can just chalk, you know, some people might chalk it up to age, but, uh, when I was 38, and came back to this and, and came across information that it was just like, no, actually humans are carnivores. That's just the kind of animal that we are. And that's the way we're supposed to be eating. And just like any animal in the wild, any animal in the zoo, if you feed an animal what it's biologically designed to eat, it's going to be much more healthy, much more vigorous. And it's not going to get these these you know, nagging chronic Ill, ailments that, that we face as a mainstay of modern medicine. And I looked back and I was like, that's what I was doing. You know, for five years, I was I was living as a carnivore, and that's biologically what we are, and that's why I've never felt better in my entire life. And so at that point, I just I was determined. I was just like, right, that's it. I knew it. I knew plants were trying to kill me. Get rid of these stupid things. I just cut them out. And then at 38, I went on a carnivore diet, and uh, all of a sudden, I just got back from doing humanitarian work. I was doing um, some volunteering as a doctor in the refugee camps in Southern Bangladesh, helping the Rohingya refugees escaping genocide in Burma. And so I was not working out, hadn't played a full season of rugby in three years. And I was, you know, fat and out of shape, you know what I mean? For me and two weeks on a carnivore diet, I felt so good. I was like, right, I'm going back out. I'm going to play with the Saracens again, who had just turned it that year, uh, joined the, the MLR and uh, as the sea wolves and so i was like right i'm back out i'm gonna i'm gonna go out and play and i felt great i hadn't i hadn't run you know properly in in a year or more and hadn't played a real season in three years and i felt great i was out there you know running you know step for step with everybody and even though they've been there for months and and i hadn't been doing anything and i felt amazing and you know two weeks in you know i'm just getting better and better and better and my my fitness is already picking up and i felt great i unfortunately had a, a knee injury that year so i wasn't able to actually you know play properly but physically i felt amazing i was you know my my athleticism was back on uh, you know on par for when i was in my early 20s and i had 15 more years of, of experience on the field now so that was great and, you know, I, I felt absolutely amazing. You know, my body worked like, like you would hope that it would, that most people, when they pass 30, they're, they're struggling to stay on top of it. But, uh, I, you know, I felt better at 38 than I did at, at 28, you know, playing in the super league down at on and, you know, and so I just, I just ran with that. And so I started really digging into the research, really digging into the literature and started looking and say, okay, what do we know? What can we prove? And just asking questions and trying to find answers. And I, when I, as a doctor, when I looked at this, you know, problem that we face with modern, modern disease, and modern medicine, when I started looking at human health from that perspective, that humans are carnivores, that's the kind of animal we are. And we're, we're carnivores that are not eating as such. And we're eating these plants that aren't actually, uh, we aren't actually completely capable of detoxifying properly. They don't have all the requisite nutrients they need. They even have anti-nutrients that can stop us from, from gaining proper nutrition, even from meat. And, uh, and that's what's harming us and hindering us. And everything in medicine just started slotting into place. And I started uh, applying this into my medical practice and, and have seen absolutely fantastic results for my patients as well as for athletes who, um, who I've spoken to and have gotten on a carnivore diet and have really taken their game to the next level. That's, uh, that's definitely pretty interesting. And, and, and I haven't tried to do anything performance-wise with, uh, with this, obviously, but, uh, but that's everybody's main question is, where do you get your vitamins from? Where do you get your nutrients from? Bruce, are you out of your mind? <laughs> there you go. That, that, I'm not cool with that answer. But, uh, <laughs> but that's, that's really the question. As, as my kid said to me, he's like, you're the only guy I know is like, fuck celery! And, <laughs> and uh, I want you to, and first off, Brussels sprouts taste like shit. We'll yep. talk about the evolutionary thing about that. So that's yep, why yep, I'm yep. bacon on them. 
because bacon tastes great and Brussels yeah. sprouts don't. But yeah. I'd like you to get into bioavailability and and some of the reasons evolutionarily that we're a diet that that this is the proper human diet. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I mean, think evolutionarily, think about that bad taste. It, why would we have evolved to hate the taste of something that's good for us? Why would we evolve to hate the taste that's, that's uh, hate the, something that is the best for us, right? You know, deer don't go around eating the shitty tasting leaves, right? They don't have a, a, a health coach going like, you know, I know those taste like shit, but they'll look great on your ass. You know, just eat those like those leaves. Like that's not what they do, right? They eat what tastes good. Right. So, you know, and that's because our tongue and our brain are sophisticated machines is one of your major senses is one of your major sense organs and they can recognize harmful chemicals. And so that's where that bad taste comes from. It's like it, it's a warning. It's a direct warning from your body, from your brain saying, hey, there's something in here that's bad for you. Do not eat this, spit this out. And that's why your natural instinct is to spit it out. That's why if you give an infant you know, broccoli or something, which most people find quite benign. It's like, oh yeah, broccoli, I don't mind it. You give it to a kid, I mean, it's just like his face turns, they'll cry and spit it out and, and be very upset. And that's because their brain is telling them, hey, do not eat this, this is bad for you. Now, there are other things that, that may taste good for you that aren't necessarily good for you, like sugar, but sugar is an outlier, it's a drug, it gives an addiction, a dopamine hit to the addiction centers of your brain, just like cocaine, heroin, and meth. And there are studies with MRI showing that Fructose specifically kills the same areas of your brain as meth to the same extent as meth. Okay, so this is a drug and, uh, and it's an addictive drug. And so you, you get that sort of hit. Your body recognizes this. We think evolutionarily that, that fructose is very, very sweet, the sweetest of the carbohydrates because we recognize this as something that we can, we can eat safely in the short term. There isn't anything that will kill you dead that contains fructose that we know of. And so it's thought that we evolved to recognize that as more sweet because we, we found it's safe. You get this quick hit of energy and then you can go on, you know, you get your, your mammoth or whatever you're eating. Um, so that's, um, so that's a, bit run, a bit of a rundown on taste evolutionarily. As far as vitamins are concerned, um, everything you need is in meat in the proportion that you need. What are we trying to do when we eat? We're trying to build and maintain animal tissue. We're trying to build and maintain meat. So it has everything that you need animal tissue, meat, right? And so any animal, I mean, this is why you see like deer and elk chewing up you know, snakes and moles and things like that and just eating them, right? Because animal tissue is good for all animals, but only certain animals can transform plant tissue into animal tissue. It's actually quite difficult. Most animals aren't able to break down and metabolize um, uh, fiber. And so, you know, actually no vertebrate animal can, can break down fiber, but the bacteria in their gut, they have a special, you know, gut, like the rumen of a cow, they cultivate these bacteria and they can break down the fiber and they actually, the bacteria break down the fiber and the, as a byproduct, they secrete short chain fatty acids and then the bacteria die off and, and that turns into protein. So a cow eats grass and fiber, but what they absorb is fat and protein. And so, you know, that is, you know, to your point about bioavailability, that is a, a very uh, important nutrient, that fiber, which is strings of glucose. They are not bioavailable to us. We cannot access those, uh, those glucose molecules. We don't have the capability of it, and we don't have the guts that can harbor those bacteria. So, back, so plants will defend themselves by many, many means. There's, they make about, the plant kingdom makes about 1 million different chemicals. Most of those are to poison or deter animals and insects and stop them from eating them. Is kill or be killed in the wild for plants as well as animals. And one of those defenses is, you know, not necessarily being poisonous, but by locking up and sequestering their nutrients in, in ways and with bonds that we can't break down and that, that many animals can't break down. So, you know, you look at spinach, oh, look at this high iron content, look at all this calcium in there, that is not available to us. We don't actually have access to that. There were studies in the 1950s uh, giving people a bunch of spinach, they, oh, we wanna raise their, their calcium levels up. And they found that paradoxically, their calcium levels actually dropped, and that's because their calcium is not available. And in fact, they contain a a very high amount of oxalates. It's one of these defense chemicals, one of these class of defense chemicals, oxalates. They turn into oxalic acid in your blood. This is something that would strip rust 
off of uh, you know like clothing or or the side of your building or something like that. So it's very 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 tough stuff, and now this stuff is in your body, and it's not great for you, and that can bind calcium and other minerals and strip them out of your blood, and then you need to pull more calcium out of your bones in order to replace your serum calcium or else you'll die. You cannot have uh, you know, below a certain amount of calcium or your, your heart will stop and you'll have an arrhythmia, uh, a fatal arrhythmia. So in fact, people, they were eating, uh, eating uh, salads or, or spinach and a uh, you know, salad or whatever, even though there's a lot of calcium in it, their calcium would go down because the calcium in there wasn't available and they had oxalates that were now stripping more calcium out of your body and there there are many 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 more examples of this but you know the protein that's in plants uh is not very bioavailable there are even protease inhibitors and things like wheat and soy that go in and block your enzyme protease enzymes from the pancreas so that even if you're eating like a sandwich or you know some a piece of bread with a steak or something like that that protease inhibitors gets in there and now your your body has more difficulty breaking down the 100% bioavailable protein that is in meat. So, you know, of the protein that's available in plants, a it's it's not 100% bioavailable, but there's also other things in there that can make it even less available and, and stop you from absorbing these things as well. Fiber, fiber is an anti nutrient as well because it actually is, makes physical blockages between your enzymes and the food that you're trying to digest, and then the digested food and the lumen of your intestines so you can't absorb it. So you can't break it down as well, you can't absorb it as well, and so this thing goes into your colon, bacteria get a hold of it, this can cause dysbiosis, and, and you know the, people talk about the microbiome and how this is you know, good or bad depending on, on where you're at, but this disrupts your microbiome because what you eat is what your microbiome eat, and then you eliminate it out. You just, you know, it just goes in the toilet and it's not going in you. Whereas if you're just eating meat and you're only eating meat, not with all these fiber, not with all these, these, uh, um, digestive disruptors, you will absorb 98 plus percent of the meat that you eat. And so you'll, you'll see this in your, in your waist. You'll actually not go to the bathroom more than once or twice a week because you're absorbing all of this stuff. So there's nothing coming out. People freak out about that. They're, oh my God, I must be constipated. I must be all blocked up. Well, no, if you're eating enough fat and you're eating things in the right right proportions, then uh, you won't get constipated. Um, just quickly on that, we our bodies have a limited capacity to absorb fat. And after we run out of that, fat goes out. And it's that excess fat that actually keeps your stool soft. So it doesn't matter how long that stays there. It can stay in your colon until Christmas. Fat repels water, so it's already dried out, right? But it's the fat that's going to keep that soft. And so it can stay there for as long as you want, but it'll st remain soft and, and come out fine. So those are just some of the some of the things. So, um, And there are many, many, many examples of the lack of bioavailability in, uh, in plants. Um, but in, um, in meat, you get everything you need. One good way of, of looking at this, okay, well, you know, people look at the, you know, the recommended daily allowances. Maybe this doesn't have all the, you know, the manganese that you need or vitamin C. That's a common one. Oh, you're going to get scurvy. Well, I've been doing this for, you know, six years now. Again, I don't have scurvy. I don't have any sign of scurvy. I remember actually thinking that in my early twenties, I was like, do I need to eat a banana or something or take a multivitamin? And I remember I was like, well, you know, I feel good. My gums aren't bleeding. So I'm just going to ride this out and see what happens. And of course you don't need that. The Inuit don't need that. The Maasai don't need that. There were populations alive today, current civilizations that have never uh, eaten anything except meat or animal products, or at least predominantly so. And, you know, people would say what they want about, you know, different populations. But when you get, you know, a couple hundred miles away from the North Pole, like you're not eating plants, there are no plants. And so, you know, when you're on the ice flows up in, you know, northern Canada and Alaska, that's what you're eating is meat. And, uh, and that's what they, they traditionally ate. And what about our ancestors during the ice ages? What plants were available for them to eat? None, especially in certain areas when it's just just covered in ice sheets when we were hunting mammoths. Um, you know, the people that crossed the land bridge from Asia to North America during the last ice age, where exactly were the, the, the potatoes and yams and and uh, and citrus fruit to get them the, the vitamin C? They weren't there. So, you know, intuitively in that way, okay, well, people have done this since the, you know, the dawn of history, you know, the dawn of, um, of humankind. Uh, and and have been fine, 
But let's see from a, from a scientific perspective. Okay, vitamin C. We need X amount of vitamin C. Well, fine. Well, what do we need the vitamin C for to sca- stave off scurvy? Scurvy is a misdevelopment of your of your collagen, and so you need vitamin C to catalyze a reaction to hydrolyze proline and lysine, and these are proteins, amino acids that form up collagen. And if they if they're not hydrolyzed, then they don't bond properly. You get weak connective tissue. You start breaking down and you can die. It's very, very serious. And you can have problems long before that as well. So the problem is, is that depending on what you eat, you need a different constellation of nutrients, vitamins and nutrients. Okay. So when you're eating carbohydrates, for example, carbohydrates, you know, uh, look very similar molecularly to vitamin C. So vitamin C looks sort of like a fructose molecule with a little tail on it. And it just so happens that these are similar enough that they actually use the same uh, transport molecule, uh, GLUT4 receptor, to bring these into your body and then to utilize them throughout your body. And so when you're eating carbohydrates and your blood sugar is high, you're actually going to block out a lot of the vitamin C. So you need to eat a lot more vitamin C to overcome uh, this blockade and then uh, have even more in your system in order to you know utilize that effectively if you have high blood sugar. So if you're eating carbohydrates, you need a daily amount of vitamin C measured in milligrams. But if you're not eating carbohydrates, then you only need vitamin C measured in nanograms. So it's one millionth of a milligram. Okay, so it's very, very different. And there's an absolute abundance of vitamin C in meat if you consider uh, that if you're not eating carbohydrates, and in fact, there are a lot of you know, wild animals and you know, uh, liver uh, as well, or regeneratively farmed uh, livestock, grass-fed, grass-finished, uh, that actually have way more vitamin C than that. And so, even even if you were looking at the RDAs, they would still satisfy our need for for vitamin C, even if you were eating carbohydrates. But if you're not eating carbohydrates, you don't need nearly as much. You need roughly one millionth of uh, the amount of vitamin C. And so so that's the main thing. If you're not eating plants and you're not eating these things that can disrupt your body's ability to absorb and utilize nutrients, you need far different nutrients, a uh, far different amount of these nutrients, and meat gives you everything that you need. And that's why I think that we're not omnivores, optimally. I mean, omnivores in the sense that we can eat other things, but cats can eat other things too. Cats are classified as obligate carnivores, and yet they can get 60% of their uh, calories from carbs, okay? So does that make them omnivores because they can eat something? No, uh, because they, they thrive on meat. That's why they do their best health-wise, and that's us as well. So there's nothing in plants that we have to have that we cannot get from meat if we're only eating meat and we're not gumming up the works. But there are things in meat that you have to have that you cannot get from plants. And so you have to eat meat. You don't have to eat plants. And in fact, you don't want to eat plants because they have these defense chemicals. They have these hormonal disruptors. They have these digestive disruptors that make it more difficult for you to thrive and succeed as as an individual when you're eating them. And so for optimal performance, for optimal health, we are obligate carnivores, I would say. So that's very interesting. A lot of people say there's good carbohydrates and bad carbohydrates, any and even net carbohydrates when you take out fiber. And 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 you would just explain there that fiber isn't necessarily great. And I used to take psyllium husk all the time and my poops were gigantic and, and but you know, and, and as you said, eating eating carnivore, you know, I, I may I may go to the bathroom four times a week, you know, maybe three and then people like you know, and I used to be like one of those guys who, you know, Al Bundy and, and Archie Bunker <laughs> walking down, sitting on the ball. And, you know, you hear, <laughs> hear the big crash going. Um, one other one thing about can you talk about how the body really is trying to absorb as you go down the digestive tract that it is trying to absorb fat and protein mm. and and. Ha- and when the minute it gets carbohydrate, whether it's complex or simple, you know, the complex gets, and it is trying to eliminate that out of your body through, you know, insulin and how hyperinsulinemia and all that kind of things that can cause metabolic syndrome, probably what I had. I, and, you know, I, my, 
quote unquote blood work was good. I didn't have high blood pressure or any of this other mm. crazy, all this other stuff. But I'm, but meanwhile, I'm 300 and something pounds. Like, give me a break. Yeah. And I'm 5'8 with a lump on my head. Uh, you know, so this day, like, as I said, kick yeah. me down the street and I roll four miles. So, mm. and that's, so could, could you talk about that? Because pe people, look, this definitely scares the shit out of people only because it is so against everything they've heard. And I think that a lot of people are learning that a lot of shit that you heard is nonsense if you haven't woken up in the last, I would say in, in my world, 40 years, but all right, let's just say in the last five or six that if you haven't woken up yet, then you are, you're probably staying asleep. Yeah. So, I mean, but that's the thing though. I mean, that's what we've been told for the last 40 or 50 years, but before that it was the, it was the exact opposite. It was the exact oh, can I opposite. Interrupt you? Can I interrupt you? Yeah. One of my favorite, I don't watch TV. I haven't watched TV in a long time. Like I'm watching 13 years actually, or read, or read a newspaper in 13 years. Mm -hmm. But, so I'm relatively uninformed, but however, South Park was one of my favorite shows because it's irreverent toward people who were sanctimonious. Mm -hmm. And Chef used to always have a thing that he would serve to the children. It was Salisbury Steak Day. And can yeah. you tell us about Salisbury Steak yeah. and why Salisbury Steak is great for you? And then you can get into your bioavailability because then you can see the chef did have wisdom and and so anyway yeah well i mean salisbury steak that was um that was actually named after uh, a doctor named dr j h salisbury i always thought it was a place named like salisbury england or something like that but no it was it was named after dr j h salisbury who was a new who was a new york doctor in the 1800s who did a 30-year research project into the optimal health uh, for human beings, and he and he tested a whole bunch of different things, did experimental trials, eating different sorts of things, looking at the results. He lived with the Native Americans and Plains Indians for a while, uh, who were only eating buffalo uh, all year round. And there's there's actually studies showing that the plant those Plains Indians in the 1800s just eating buffalo, they were the tallest human beings on earth. They were the tallest population on earth, and the average height of a population denotes the average health of a population. So these guys, these guys were giants, they were monsters, and they were just eating meat. And that's why they were giants and monsters. Actually, before the agricultural revolution, we were five inches taller, had bigger brains, 11% larger brains, um, had, had less uh, teeth de tooth decay and crowding, all these sorts of things, directly after agriculture uh, hit in, you know, uh, archaeologists can actually and paleoanthropologists can actually look at uh, the, the skull shape and and the, the the mouth formation and things like that, and can actually tell if you were before or after agriculture because they were shorter in stature, five inches shorter, smaller brains, messed up teeth and jaws, way more cavities and crooked teeth. That's not genetic. That's actually um, uh, mal malnutrition. And they had all these different signs of, of tuberculosis in their bones and their spine, and, uh, and and signs of poor wound healing, shorter femurs. All these things are signs of malnutrition, of, of poor nutrition, of worse nutrition. And so the Plains Indians did not suffer from that. These guys were monsters. And so he saw this. He saw how they were doing. He saw that you know by their records, we didn't have uh, you know government records for them at the time, but they were living to be 110, 115, 120 years old or more. And that seems a bit far-fetched considering that we, we generally have a, an average life expectancy in our 70s around the world today. But if you understand that we know as geneticists now, I, I learned take, taking genetics, genetics at the University of Washington, uh, which was, was that they spearheaded the Human Genome Project this is one of the top genetics programs in the world. I was taught that human beings are genetically designed to live 120 years on average, right? And so that's what we're genetically designed for. So if what that means is if you just stay out of your own way and just don't mess up, you should make it to 120 without doing anything special. And yet we're dying in our 60s and 70s. Why is that? I think that's because we're eating the wrong thing and we're, we're curtailing our, our health and our life, our life expectancy. Um, so he was seeing this. He was noticing these guys were living to be great age. They weren't just you know turning to dust slowly over decades in the nursing home, but they were out there as living as Stone Age nomads with a pack on their back, you know, following the buffalo herds day in and day out. You know, these, these were you know hale and hearty, fit, uh, active adults in their in well over 100 years old. 
and with no modern medicine or anything else. So he found that through his experimentation, through his research, decades of research, he found that this was long before processed sugar, before seed oils even existed, but that people they were eating more grains and plants were getting disease, diseases other people simply weren't. They were more susceptible to tuberculosis. They were getting autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. Uh, they were getting gout, all these different sorts of things um, that, that were causing huge, huge problems. We did not have the pharmacological options then as we do now. And so people were really, really suffering. And so he found that he could cure these people by putting them on a pure red meat and water diet. And so just by putting on just a beef only diet, just our, our pure evolutionary diet, that you got rid of these things. What does that mean? That means that something in the food is causing these diseases that's triggering uh, and precipitating these sorts of very serious illnesses in the genetically susceptible. It's not going to do it for everyone. You know, if we, you know, not everyone's going to get rheumatoid arthritis, but some people who are genetically susceptible will. And so that's what he found. And so he wrote a book called uh, The Relation of Alimentation and Disease. Alimentation being your aliment, alimentary tract is your digestive tract. So the relationship between what we eat and the diseases that we get. He wrote this book in the 1800s saying that these foods cause these diseases. And so if you want to get rid of these diseases, you stop eating that food and you just go back to eating just red meat and water. And that was something that was actually well documented, well studied for decades after Salisbury. And there were multiple books and papers written about that afterwards. There was even as, as recently as 1975, there was a Dr. Uh, Volklin who uh, was a gastroenterologist and he wrote a book called The Stone Age Diet. And he showed, he just argued, hey, look, humans are, are carnivores. This is the, the, the evidence for this. And the diseases that we're facing nowadays, as they're going up, this is because we're eating plants, we're not living as a carnivore. And he basically argued that all the different IBD, IBS sort of issues that he treated as a mainstay as, as a gastroenterologist would just go away if you just stopped eating plants. He's like, you know, you don't need my profession if you don't eat plants. And so that, you know, th there's 100 years of medical literature and scientific research and, and books written about this. Up until 1977, when the USDA declared that cholesterol causes heart disease, saturated fat increases cholesterol, stop eating all of these things. And of course, that vilified meat, the vilified eggs, because they had fat and cholesterol in them. And that was it. Before that, everyone damn well knew that meat and fat were the most important things that you could get. And when people could afford it, they got it. That's why it's called rich food. Oh, well, it's very rich. That was <laughs> that, where that comes from. Rich people could afford fatty food. The fatty cuts were the, what the rich people got because those were the good cuts, and that's what people wanted. And so in 1977, USDA said that cholesterol causes heart disease, and, that, and that's where all this comes from. So, so meat became vilified. But what happened with that, right? Well, we reduced our red meat intake by over 33%, reduced fat and cholesterol by about the same, increased fruits and vegetables by 30 and 40% respectively, re really increased the amount of grains that we were eating tripled the amount of high fructose corn syrup we were eating, tripled the amount of seed oils we were eating, and what were the results? Well, the obesity rate tripled, heart disease tripled, stroke rate tripled, cancer rates tripled, type 2 diabetes, autoimmune disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, even neurodevelopmental delays such as autism all increased exponentially. They almost didn't exist before then, now they're the only things that we treat. And people say, well, maybe we didn't notice it, maybe just people weren't paying attention, that's garbage. You know, people were absolutely paying attention. You look back at the literature, the, these were very, very, very well uh, documented uh, in their prevalence and incidence throughout uh, you know, America for sure, and Europe as well, uh, but let's say that everyone was, you know, everyone born before 1986 was an idiot and just couldn't pay attention, just couldn't notice that someone was was having bloody diarrhea 30 times a day. They just didn't notice. And, uh, you know, for someone with Crohn's disease um, or that their children just weren't learning properly and had autism, uh, which was a well-described uh issue at the time. So we knew well about it. But in the 90s, they made that claim. So, well, maybe we just weren't noticing this. Maybe you just weren't noticing that children were getting what was called then adult onset diabetes instead of actually thinking about why 10-year-olds were getting type 2 diabetes. They just renamed it type 2 diabetes. Before it was adult onset diabetes and juvenile diabetes. And now it's type 1 and type 2, right? Or flipped around. So maybe you could say that we weren't paying attention before that which is wrong, but you could say that. Um, we were paying attention after that. And every successive decade, these diseases have gotten worse and worse. 
And we're, again, eating less and less meat, more and more of these uh, things that, that are not biologically uh, you know, appropriate for us. And we're getting sicker. We're getting fatter. We're getting sicker. And, uh, and, and this problem is compounding. So I think that's directly related to eating the wrong thing. The main reason, and, and the things we know that that's wrong in the first place, we know we see the evidence, right? We, that we, we run the experiment, we played this game, it's wrong, right? The you know, physicist Richard Feynman said, it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is, and it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. So we ran the experiment with hundreds of millions of people in America, with billions of people around the world, and every single country that followed our recommendations has seen the exact same increase in obesity and, and chronic diseases when they followed those guidelines, every single one, every single time. And so there you go, it's wrong. But we also have, we also have documentation of this. You know, we have the, the, the tobacco files where the tobacco companies, uh, you know, I've been lying for 30 years to Congress saying, oh, there's no evidence that, you know, uh, cigarettes cause cancer. We have all these studies that show that actually, you know, doesn't do that at all and is not addictive at all, all these sorts of things. But then their memos came out, their internal memos got leaked that actually said, yeah, we, we fully know that this stuff is horrible and awful. We need to cover this stuff and we need to put out opposition research. Well, now we have the sugar files because the Journal of the American, well, University of California, San Francisco Medical School, uh, published in the Journal of, of the American Medical Association, JAMA, which is one of the top medical journals in the world, uh, published in 2016 actual internal memos from the sugar companies detailing how they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol caused heart disease when it was really sugar and to exonerate sugar and say it was safe and it was just an empty calorie. That's where that phrase comes from. And one of those professors was named head of the USDA, and it was he who authored and published that 1977 declaration saying that cholesterol caused heart disease, saturated fat creates cholesterol, stop eating that. And it changed the world. It absolutely revolutionized how we think about nutrition, how we think about food, and to the, the utter detriment of our health. And it was a lie. We know it's a lie. We even know what they got paid. We know their contracts. They got paid $6,500 which is equivalent of $50,000 now. So the guy bought a, you know, a mid-sized sedan, he, you know, he went home with a Camry and that was what his, his, uh, his uh, soul and integrity was worth. And, and the health of humanity was worth. Uh, other people are, are the same. Ansel Keys, this guy was uh, a professor out of, out of Minnesota, I think. Um, he was on the cover of Time Magazine for coming, for, for really being the face of the cholesterol theory of, of heart disease. He's a paid shill. We know that he was paid too. We know he was on, on the payroll for these guys as well. And he, we have clear evidence that he doctored and fudged and cherry picked in his studies, vilifying or just just even showing a, a correlation between cholesterol and heart disease. Which you you can't prove causation from correlation, right? But you know, so there has never been any high level evidence showing causation between cholesterol and and heart disease, none ever. And in fact, his own studies actually didn't even show a correlation or a weak correlation at, at best. And there are plenty of studies that show there's no correlation at all between higher LDL cholesterol and heart disease or saturated fat and heart disease. In fact, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology published in 2020, a large literature review looking at you know, all the, the available best evidence on saturated fat and cholesterol, looking at randomized controlled trials, uh, meta-analyses, everything like that. And they concluded that there is that there is no association, no correlation between increased saturated fat intake and heart disease. So you can't prove correlation. Uh, you can't, you can't prove causation from correlation, but if you show that there's no correlation, that proves there is no causation. You cannot have causation without correlation first, right? And so there's no correlation. That means there's no causation. So there is no correlation between increased saturated fat intake and heart disease. And in fact, they found that there was an inverse correlation between saturated fat intake and stroke rate. So people who eat more saturated fat, lower risk of getting a stroke, lower saturated fat, higher risk of getting a stroke. So that's you know, completely backwards. And so, yes, you know, people are concerned like, oh my gosh, what about cholesterol? What about this? What about that? Yeah, that, that's, that's a concern that we have, but that's why. 
we were lied to, we were misled, and we we have we have the notes, we have the papers. Like this isn't a, this isn't a question anymore. We we know for a cold frozen fact that this was a fraud, and that you know this that saturated fat and cholesterol and meat were never a problem. In fact, University of Washington just published a major paper last year showing that there was no ill effects from eating meat, especially processed red meat. They went through hundreds of studies. You know that, that that you know said, oh well, red meat's bad; it can cause cancer. They said these were lazy studies, these were bad science, often biased. One of the biases that they have was uh, it, including uh, meat in in processed foods. So just calling a processed food because they have an ingredient of meat, they're saying, well, that's that's meat then. So pizza sometimes has toppings that are meat. Therefore, pizza is meat. Fast food, McDonald's, whatever, hamburger patties are meat. Therefore, you go to McDonald's, that's meat. And so they, they, they counted that. So people that would eat less fast food obviously would have better health outcomes. And they're like, oh, that's because they're eating less meat. It's a fraud. And so they looked at that and they found that there was absolutely you know, no indication, no evidence that, that meat was actually a health detriment at all. And so and certainly not a cancer risk and certainly not for unprocessed red meat. And people say, okay, well, what about processed meat? Well, what are they processed with? They're not processed with more meat. It's not meat added into meat. They add in sugar, they add in chemicals, they add in uh, other sorts of seasonings and, and plants, right? They're not adding in meat, they're adding, so it's all those other things that they're adding in that- Hey everyone, if you need a little extra help getting started on a carnivore diet, and my online resources that I have for free aren't enough for you, you can go to www.howtocarnivore.com and sign up for our 30-day carnivore challenge where you'll have online resources, group support, weekly Zoom meetings, as well as the ability to chat live with myself, Simon Lewis, and the others in the challenge who can help you and support you and give you extra advice and help you along the way. So if that sounds like something that would be beneficial to you, then please go to howtocarnivore.com and sign up. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you there. Um, you know so- what? I'm, I just want to say one thing before you mm-hmm. is if, if you're thinking about correlation and causation just for listeners is mm-hmm. say a person lives to be 85 years old and they're a smoker. It doesn't mean that they lived to 85 because they smoked. It's generally yeah. probably in spite of the fact that they smoked or that they had three glasses of scotch every day. Like, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of times people are like, yeah, well, my grandfather did this. And, and it's like, you know, he probably yeah. also ate, a, a healthier diet than, than you're giving him credit for. He probably had bacon and eggs most days for breakfast. He probably had, you know, some kind of a, a steak for dinner with maybe a vegetable. He probably did not eat, order out pizza every night and do things like that. But the reality is that because he smoked wasn't the reason he lived. That's, yeah. it, that, that's all I just, was, just wanted to explain. That. Yeah. And, and, and I would want you to, can, can, and I know I, I, threw you off with the Salisbury steak. Could you go through that digestive tract and why, yeah. like in the appendix, why we don't have one? And mm-hmm. well, it, it's like it, the, a non anything, but in, in other animals, it's a big ass thing. And it's a, and, and why we are carnivores and like our stomach acid, mm-hmm. et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and, and just to your point, you know, with the correlation, like you know, people say, it was like, well, you know, my, my, you know, my grandparents lived into their nineties or almost a hundred and, you know, they did X, Y, and Z. Okay. Well, we also have already covered the fact that we we're supposed to live to 120. So even if they lived to 95, they died 20, 25 years early, right. On average. Right. So, you know, it's not necessarily a great thing. You're, they're, they're doing better, than the norm, but the norm is sick. 90% of Americans have at least one metabolic illness. 70% of Americans are overweight or obese. So, you know, comparing yourself to, to the average is not where you want to be. You want to, you want to compare yourself to what you are genetically capable of. And we are, we are genetically capable of doing a hell of a lot more than we are now. So, um, as far as, um, our digestion, well, like you, like you alluded to, like our, our, our bodies are, are geared up towards eating fat. So why would fat be bad for us if we have five organs working in concert just to absorb fat, right? Go into our stomach, that starts break, the breakdown process, and pushes it into our, our uh, and small intestine. Our liver makes bile, gallbladder stores it, 
And then pancreas makes enzymes that uh, break down uh, fat and proteins and, and make it available. Then bile uh, emulsifies the fat, and then your small intestine absorbs it, right? So you have five organs all working together. One of those things goes wrong. You're not absorbing fat. All five of those things have to be working well together. Um, well, you can, not all of them have to be perfect, but you know they are all working together to absorb fat. And that is, that is because fat is extraordinarily important to our health and our energy and our longevity. It is an essential nutrient. It is not just a calorie source, right? So there are the essential fatty acids that you need, like DHA, EPA, and, and many others. And fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin K2, D3, uh, vitamin A, and so on. So these are, these are essential nutrients. They're not just calories. As far as our digestion, people say, well, you know, we're, um, you know, we don't have big teeth and fangs like a, like, you know, like a lion or a wolf. And of course we don't because, uh, first of all, we're primates, you know, so we're, we're not a canine or a feline. So we have primate teeth, you know, and also we don't kill things with our mouths. So we don't need big, crazy clashing, you know, fangs. And what about a gorilla? Gorillas are herbivores, right? They, they, they just eat plants, right? They've got big teeth, big jaws, big fangs, right? That's not, that's not, uh, you know, predatory. That's can be defensive and just scare people off or whatever, but you know, they're eating sticks and that's why their jaws are big. That's where their teeth are big. So we have primate teeth with carnivorous adaptations. When we started our ancestors millions of years ago, started eating more meat, started eating more and more meat. We started getting more and more adaptations towards where we are today. So our teeth started getting smaller. Our jaws got smaller. Our muscles of mastication or temporalis muscle got smaller. And that's because we're eating softer and softer foods. We're not chewing on sticks all day like a gorilla is. So they need big jaws, big muscles. When you look at the gorilla's head, most of that is the, it's temporalis muscles. It actually has this crest of bone up here. Its brain is much more sunken in. It's big muscles over the core, over the, their head like that. And that's just because they just have to chew so much really, really tough material like a millstone. They've just got to grind this stuff down day in and day out. They have to eat, you know, around 60 pounds of leaves a day, right? And just to, just to get the amount of nutrition, they, they don't even get all the nutrition out of that. They actually don't get all the vitamins like B12 and things like that. They don't get that just from eating leaves. They actually make it in their colon and they have to eat their feces to get enough vitamin B12 or to get any vitamin B12. So if that's what you guys want to do, you can go for it. I, I will pass. I will just go for the for the steak myself. But, you know, and then, you know, going down the track uh, in our digestion, you get to our stomach. Our stomach acid is extraordinarily low. I mean, it, it's certainly within the range of uh, other carnivores. It's sort of generally below two. And it's going towards what we see in, in uh, scavenger carrion animals like vultures. You know, so we have a, actually have a very, very low stomach pH. And that's because we're eating meat. And some of this meat may be old, maybe that, you know, we didn't have refrigerators all that long. And so, you know, they had, they had a high bacterial load. And so we needed a really strong concentrated uh, amount of stomach acid in order to, to break this stuff down and not get an infection. Uh, herbivores have much higher pH. It's much more towards basic and you know, from four to six, depending on the animal and, or maybe even higher. So we have extraordinarily uh, acidic stomachs. And, um, and then you look at relatively, you know, we have, we have actually pretty short guts, very, very short guts. And so we actually need to have very, very high density nutrients. We, it doesn't, it can't take forever to, to digest and absorb like a gorilla. Gorillas have a big gut, big belly. That's all just loops of intestine. So we have a much shorter gut. And so we, you know, it's thought that we, we sort of directed energy towards our brain to grow our brain and, and fund this very expensive brain from an energy and, and uh, materials uh, point of view. So our guts suffered because guts are very, very uh, energy dependent as well. So our guts shrank. And so if you look at it, people say, oh, well, you know, if you look at a proportion with a lion or this and that, it doesn't, none of that matters. We're primates. So compared to other primates, compared to other primates, we have very long, small intestines, which is where our meat gets digested and absorbed. And we have very, very short colons, which is called the large intestine. And that in herbivorous primates is actually the opposite. So they have shorter, small intestine, much longer colon and cecum. It's, it's, it, and they're called hind gut digesters. They have very, very long hind gut in the, the colon and the cecum. And that's where fiber packs in and breaks down. So you mentioned the appendix. So we have an appendix about that big, 
And um, that's a vestigial cecum. Well, a cecum in primates and other primates who actually are herbivorous, that thing's about four feet long. It's this big, long, looping thing with a, with a dead end. So this is a blind pouch and goes in there. And, uh, and, and that's where all this plant material and fiber go into. And these bacteria gets cultivated there and uh, breaks down that fiber into short chain fatty acids, which are 100% saturated. So again, if we're thinking that saturated fat is bad for us, why is it that every animal on, on the planet, uh, herbivore and carnivore, gets the majority of their calories from saturated fat. Animals, because they eat animals, other animals with fat, and then go for the fat first. And then herbivores, because they break down fiber into uh, fatty, uh, saturated fat and protein. And in fact, a gorilla that just eats green leaves, they get around 70% of their calories from saturated fat and about 30% from protein. Cows get closer to 80%. And so the, the animal kingdom runs on saturated fat. And, and, and cholesterol as well. Cholesterol is, is the building block of life, you know, every single of our brain as well. Yeah. And every single molecule or every single cell in our body, the membrane is cholesterol. I remember seeing this in eighth grade biology class and the, the cell membranes were this lipid bilayer. That lipid bilayer is cholesterol. And I remember looking at that, I was like, how can cholesterol be bad for us? We're literally made out of cholesterol. And I was like, well, you know, I'm 13. I don't know everything yet. You know, I'll, I'll just put a pin in that and come back to it. Well, the fact of the matter is cholesterol is not bad for us. And we make cholesterol because it's so important to us. It, all of our hormones are made out of cholesterol, testosterone, progesterone, um, uh, estrogen, uh, cortisol, all our mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids made in our adrenals, all of these, vitamin D, which is a hormone, it's not just a vitamin, um, all of these things are derived from cholesterol. And you don't have enough cholesterol, you don't have enough hormones. You're not going to have enough testosterone, you're not going to have enough estrogen, you're not going to have enough of uh, all of the vitamin D3, you're not going to get enough of these things. So you need all of these uh, very important molecules. So that is, you know, you can look at all these things, you can go through comparative anatomy, but the main thing it comes down to is function. Are we able to break down fiber? No, we are not. So we do not have an herbivorous gut because we cannot break down these plants, right? Herbivorous animals that eat fibrous plants, they have an ability to break down fiber, and that's where they gain the majority of their nutrients from. But in fact, we can't do that. And in fact, that's why they suggested we eat a lot more fiber in the 1980s because they said, oh, this will help you lose weight because you can't get any nutrition from it. It bulks up. It stretches out your stretch receptors. It kicks off this hormone called leptin, which tells your brain you got all this food in your stomach. And uh, and then so it'll, you'll be satiated. You can eat all of it that you want. You feel full. But in fact, you get like next to no nutrition from this. You get next to no calories from it. So that's a great, great way to lose weight because you'll eat all this salad. It feels like you're full, but you're actually getting nothing for it. Well, your, your body's a lot smarter than that. You, you know, they're like, oh, this will trick your body into thinking that you're full. Well, you're not smarter than 10 million years of evolution. And you're not going to trick a damn thing. So... Your, your stomach actually has receptors from your vagus nerve that track up to your brain that actually can monitor the amount of protein, fats, and, and minerals and vitamins coming in. And so, you know, just, just packing in a bunch of, of, of just mass in there isn't going to cut it, right? And so you're going to get bloated, you're going to feel sick, you're going to feel stuffed, and your brain is still going to tell you that you're starving and you need these nutrients, so you're going to be miserable, and this is this is I think where this is where the majority of, of eating disorders come from as well. But you know your your body is a much much smarter than the so-called experts that are that are pushing this garbage. You know so your body is is not getting the nutrients that it wants, and it knows it, and so you're not going to you're not going to uh, fool it that way. But that was the whole premise. You know, we were we were telling people to eat fiber because we couldn't break it down. We couldn't get anything from it. Now we're telling people now fiber is an, an essential nutrient. That makes no sense. It's, how is it an essential nutrient? It's not even a nutrient. You get no nutrition from it, none. And uh, in fact, it blocks absorption. It causes malabsorption. It causes uh, nutritional deficiencies as well. So I, I think that, that those are some of the main take-home points about our digestion and the simple fact that you can absorb nearly all of the meat that you eat, as long as you're not eating it with a bunch of plants and fiber, and you get very, very little of the available nutrients that are in plants. And so functionally, which is the only thing that matters, you know, we're designed to eat meat and to get all of our nutrition from meat. 
I'm not I'm not sure is is cholesterol part of the myelination process too, like myelin in your it uh, is. Well, there you go. I mean, if you want athletic performance, then you absolutely need cholesterol. Any performance. I mean, yeah. if you want to be a concert pianist, if you want to be able to sing, if you want to be able to do anything, then you know your your myelin is going to be uh, your myelination is going to be critical. Um, so a lot of people obviously they they worry about uh, well this kind of thing, and, and and you've gone through the cholesterol and I, the main cause of heart disease is diabetes, sugar, yeah. obesity, insulin, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome. Can we get into the fact that sugar is our enemy? Jack Lane said sugar is our enemy. Dr. Mm -hmm. Salisbury said sugar is our enemy. Thousands and thousands, maybe millions of other doctors have said sugar is our enemy. Can you go through the fact that, yes, plants are trying to kill you, Sugar is actually our enemy. It, it, it's an addiction yeah. that they're they're trying to kill us in a slow and controlled way. And and uh, could let's. Well, I want to get into that, and then we're going to get into the high performance because we have to debunk mm -hmm. some of the things that people think. Well, this is I'm not going to eat for performance if this is going to kill me. But oh yeah, it's actually yeah. going to help you thrive. Absolutely. And, and, yeah. and I want to get into the one thing is, and, and I don't know if this, like with Dr. Atkins, he, it, fat's fat and fat's not fat. Like seed oils, linoleic, linoleic acid, canola oil Terrible. is not, it's not fat. Terrible for you. Yeah. And, and some of the lectin things that like, like, these are not good things. Like you think like, oh, I'm, I'm eating this and it's and the brown rice or things mm -hmm. that are supposedly healthy are really wreaking havoc with your metabolic syndrome, some worse than others, like someone like me, who's like, you know, I, that's going to be bad. Someone like you, all right, brown rice is going to, it's going to, it'll accumulate over 15 years, but it's not going to kill you right away, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, it, but whatever. If you could talk yeah. about that, because sugar is, like, that's the one, and every study that they've done has mixed sugar with fat. Sugar, well, when you mix sugar with fat, you're making a fucking complete disaster. It's like, well, yeah. you know what? Throw gasoline on it. It's, it's like, uh, you know, when, 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 when Eddie Murphy was with Uncle Gus. And mm -hmm. that's a fire. <laughs> you know, sugar and fat. Now that's a fire. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you know, think about it too. You know, people say that, well, you know, how are our plants trying to kill you? How do you think obviously they're not that, that good at, uh, you know, having these defense chemicals, uh, because, you know, I eat a salad. I, I don't die. I eat a salad every night. Okay. Well, people smoke every day too. They smoke and they drink and they uh, do other things that are quite bad for them. We know they're bad for them. You know, before the 1950s, you know, you, you know, smoking used to be recommended by doctors. It's, oh yeah, this is great for you. Nine out of 10 doctors choose camel. Like, oh, I mean, there are actual ads that said this, right? So, um, you know, the point is, is that it's not that, that a salad. I, wanna, I actually want to comment on that. Yeah. How they would do that. And even when they say four out of five dentists approve Colgate, how they do yeah. it is they say, pick three or four cigarette brands or mm -hmm. three or four whatever brands. And then if that, if, they, you know, obviously Colgate Crest and whatever is on it. So all of them can say that because it's the same, you know. Yeah, they, they recommend it. It's one of the three or four that they recommend. There's only three or four to choose from or some crazy, yeah. you know, some crazy thing. So I it so basically they lie with statistics all the time. Absolutely. I'm gonna say that they yeah. lie with I'm sorry to interrupt because that's no, it's okay. To do with no, the podcast. No, you're right. I mean I, I all this stuff is a con, you know, it's it's just a marketing ploy. They're just they're just trying to sell a product. And and you know, unfortunately we're getting caught up in it and we're, we're thinking like, oh, well, this is recommended. These are the recommendations. These are the guidelines. Well, that must mean that they're good for you. The hell they are. You know, the majority of these things, first of all, they change guidelines every five years, right? So if these were right the first time, why why'd they ever change, right? And guidelines take decades to catch up. And it's bureaucrats writing the guidelines. It's not scientists. It's not doctors. They may get influenced by the doctors and the scientists and say, hey, here's what the studies are. This is what we recommend. They go in behind closed doors. They have the influences that they have with industry, which is, I mean, don't kid yourself. It's there. And, uh, and then they come out with whatever the hell they want. And um, that's where the food pyramid came from. I mean, that, that was complete garbage. They, they just wanted to sell more grain because, you know, uh, President Nixon 
guaranteed uh, grains. Like I say, oh, if you if you make more corn and grains stuff like that, we'll guarantee it. We'll buy it no matter what. Um, because they wanted to get, they wanted to, to you know, sell this off to you know, uh, USSR, and they wanted to have a surplus. They want to get prices down, and um, and they all of a sudden has massive, massive, massive surplus. And so they're like, okay, how the hell do we get rid of all this stuff? And so then all of a sudden they came out and said, um, you know, they said, okay, this is what when when. Um, you know, uh, Ansel Keys and stuff like that were, were being pushed out there that, you know, that such, you know, cholesterol is bad and you should eat more whole grains and sugar and crap like that. And, um, and so they said, okay, well, we recommend like eating, you know, you know, four or five servings of, of, uh, grains a day. And so they went back and they took that and went like, okay, great. Yeah. So we recommend nine to 12 servings of grains a day, right? Because they wanted to, they want to get rid of this stuff. They bought too much and, uh, and they were just going to sit there and rot. So like, okay, we need it. We need to force this on people and get them to buy it. So this is, um, the guidelines are, are crap. That's basically it. And, and you know, I, I've spoken to doctors that said, well, I, I don't care what the science says. I care what the guidelines say. I'm like, okay, well, you should not be practicing because like, and you need to be, you need to be going where the evidence is. You need to, you need to know what is actually happening, not just what some bureaucrat is telling you to say. That's really bad medicine. And, um, but with, um, and, and quickly on the myelin sheath. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you need cholesterol to to myelinate, and if people don't know what that is. That's the the insulation around your axons, which is the wire coming down off your your brain cells, and it goes down, and and that speeds up the conductivity of of your neurons firing. And so, if that's not myelinated properly, you're going to be uncoordinated. You're not going to be as intelligent. You're going to be slower body and mind. This is why infants are sort of you know can't really aren't really coordinated can't really stand falling over and things like that because their their nerves are not myelinated properly and as they their nervous system develops more and more their myelination gets better and they get more coordinated and all of a sudden they can they can walk and talk and and do all sorts of things that an adult can so that's that's the myelination and you need cholesterol for that and in fact uh, there are a number of different statin drugs that reduce cholesterol that can cross the blood brain barrier and actually interrupt your brain making cholesterol and so this has actually uh, been shown in some studies to cause a reversible form of Alzheimer's. So people getting Alzheimer's and they're like, okay, now, you know, you're putting, you know, grandpa in a home and all of a sudden you're like, oh, wait a minute, let's take them off that statin, take them off that statin. Six weeks later, they all of a sudden don't have Alzheimer's anymore. And then you put them back on the statin six weeks later. Well, look at that. They have Alzheimer's again. Wouldn't you know it? So, you know, this is, this is extraordinarily important uh, to have this and not to disrupt it. And, and change your body's ability to metabolize it and use it. Um, but specifically with, with sugar, um, you know, you were saying that, you know, heart disease is, is mainly, uh, well, much more likely uh, to be caused by diabetes, insulin resistant, things like that. That's true. So there are a number of large studies that show that cholesterol even, well, so when you have high blood, blood sugar, this is actually is directly damaging. So when your blood sugar is high, this is going to actually cause harm. If you don't eat any carbohydrates, you will make all the carbohydrates you need. I haven't eaten a carb in years, right? But my body through gluconeogenesis can make uh, carbohydrates, can make blood sugar, liver glycogen, muscle glycogen, and ketones. So my body's running on all these different energy sources off my fat stores. So I'll never run out of that. You know, if you eat carbohydrates, you know, it goes up and your insulin goes up. It actually blocks that. It stops your body from being able to access your fat stores and from making blood sugar and liver glycogen. So you actually cut that off. And so as an athlete, if, when you run out of that glycogen in your muscles, in your liver, that's it. You hit the wall, you're done. And you got to start, you know, sucking down, you know, sugary drinks and things like that to try to try to, uh, you know, get back in the game. But if you don't eat any carbohydrates at all, you will make an, an endless supply of blood sugar and glycogen and ketones as well. So the reason that happens is because when blood sugar is high, when you eat carbohydrates, your blood sugar goes up. This is damaging. Those those glucose molecules physically fuse to other molecules in your body and, and permanently damages them. And so this is killing you from the inside. And this is what kills diabetics long term, long term exposure to uh, you know high blood sugar. And just like smoking doesn't kill you that day, just like a salad is not going to kill you that day. Over the years, over the decades, this causes degradation and damage to your body, which will manifest as you know, different sorts of diseases and also with a premature death. And so your body looks at high blood sugar as, as an assault on the system and says, okay, we need to get this down quickly. And so it releases a lot of insulin. Insulin goes up. 
blood sugar comes down, but insulin has a long half-life, so it stays up for a long time, generally about 24 hours. And so your blood sugar is now coming down too far, and now you've blocked your body's ability to go at the fast stores, right? Because insulin forces energy into cells. It doesn't allow it to come out of cells, right? So as soon as your insulin goes up, it's locked down. Your fat cells are locked down. And so now your blood sugar is dropping. It's getting too low. You don't feel good. You're not, you know, you don't have a, a, enough ketones to run your brain. Your brain prefers to run on ketones, actually. And you're not making any more blood sugar. So you have to use, oh my God, I have to eat. I have to eat. I'm, I'm low blood sugar. I'm not feeling great. All these sorts of things. But it does something a bit more insidious than that, which which insulin blocks that hormone I mentioned earlier called leptin, which is secreted from our stretch receptor. It's true, but the majority of it comes from our fat cells. And this is a, this is a, a keystone hormone. This this has to do with all the other sort of hormone regulations in your body. It's very very important not to muck this thing around. But insulin binds to leptin and and blocks it from getting to your brain and telling your brain how much energy you have. So it's like a running gas gauge. Right, your brain sees all this leptin and says, "Okay, great, we've got a lot of fat stores." So now your brain gets a signal that you have zero fat stores, and your blood sugar is dropping. So it says, "If you don't eat now, you will die." It sends off a panic signal. This is why three times a day, people you know, freak out and go, oh "My God, I have to eat! I have to eat!" I haven't eaten in two days. It's been forty-eight hours since I've eaten, and I'm fine. You know, I don't do that all the time, but when things get absolutely crazy, I'm on call, I'm working overnight, I'm fine. I'm talking a mile a minute and I have nothing but energy, right? Because my body's making all the energy that I need and in the proportion that I need it, right? And so when we look at that, when we look at the damage that glycation causes, that's the fusing of the glucose molecules and, and other carbohydrates to uh, other molecules in your body, this, this causes a, a, a huge amount of damage. And also insulin, high insulin, chronically high insulin causes a ton of different diseases. Uh, first of all, it can cause uh, high blood pressure. It can cause uh, PCOS, so polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is the number one cause of fertility in women. Um, this is because high insulin blocks the conversion of testosterone into estrogen in the ovaries. And so women get far too high testosterone, far too little estrogen. And this, this really disrupts their body and their health and their menstrual cycle and their fertility. Um, it can cause uh, erectile dysfunction in men as well. So and th there's a lot of different uh, issues that high insulin, it can cause skin tags, little skin tags around your body, that darkening under your axilla and your armpit, uh, polyps in your colon, right? So you have this like, oh my God, I have all these polyps that can turn cancerous. That's, that's from insulin resistance, having chronically high insulin from having chronically high blood sugar all the time. And then eventually your body sort of gives up and you develop type 2 diabetes, right? Because you're, you're having to make, you're having to pump out so much more insulin and you're getting more and more resistant to it. You know, like any sort of access to a drug, your body's just like, hey, this is too much. We don't want this. And so you start building up barriers and resistance to it and you start building up insulin resistance. And then your body stops being able to make all the insulin necessary to overwhelm that system. And then you start seeing your blood sugar go a bit crazy. But for 10 years before you have the first sign of your blood sugar going up. Oh, you're maybe pre-diabetic, now you're diabetic. For 10, 15 years before that, you've had insulin resistance and you've had this disruption to your metabolism that, that we see in this. And so that hyperglycemia can actually damage your cholesterol molecules as well and knock off um, a signaling protein on or signaling molecule on your uh, LDL proteins or LDL uh, lipoproteins that uh, signal that that are what your liver recognizes and, and can pull these things out of your out of your blood system, right? So it's just, without that, the only thing that can sort of suck these things up are your macrophages that turn into big foam cells. You just sort of soak these things up because they're just they can't get rid of them, and so you turn into these foam cells. You get damaged to your artery lining, and these things go there and they get stuck. That's a thought to be how. Um, how atherosclerosis builds up in heart disease. So that's not the cholesterol causing a problem. It's you've damaged the cholesterol first, and then that's being utilized in this in this other issue. And also that that's a contentious theory as well. That's, there's other other theories that um, you know explain what's going on very well. We don't honestly know exactly what causes heart disease or or the even the physiological mechanisms, but we do see these associations. So. There are a number of studies that don't show any correlation between LDL cholesterol and heart disease. There are some that show, if they show anything, a very weak association. There are other studies that show that SDLDL, these small dense lipoproteins, these damaged 
LDL cholesterol molecules from glycation, from oxidative stress, from like things like seed oils or smoking or alcohol or things like that, that those have about a 1.7 times increased risk of uh, developing heart disease if you have this, this damaged, nasty LDL cholesterol, which again, it's not the cholesterol's fault. Something else has damaged it, right? But people with metabolic syndrome, they are six times more likely to develop, to develop heart disease. People with type 2 diabetes are 10 times more likely to develop heart disease, which is up there with smoking, right? And again, if you're diabetic, you know, you've been eating a lot of carbs for decades and you're damaging your cholesterol. So it's not the cholesterol doing the problem, causing the problem. It's, it's the hyperglycemia. It's the damage to your body. Sugar namely, specifically fructose, you know, because sugar is just a, a name for carbohydrates or, you know, dozens of different kinds of carbohydrates. Fructose is, is a really nasty customer. All carbohydrates will raise your insulin and your blood sugar and raise your insulin. But fructose in particular is nasty. You know, we mentioned that before, that fructose sends a dopamine signal to the addiction center of your brain, so it's addictive like a hard drug. But it's also uh, metabolized and broken down your liver into the same byproducts that alcohol is. So you get the exact same breakdown products from fructose as you do alcohol. So you get the same damage to your body and your liver from breaking down fructose as you do from breaking down alcohol. So you get fatty liver disease, cirrhosis, diabetes, heart disease, and even uh, it's even implicated in things like cancer and Alzheimer's disease. So this is a nasty, nasty, nasty subject. This is something that was shown at the uh, University of San Francisco uh, or University of California, San Francisco uh, Medical School and Biochemistry Department in 2009. And, and, you know, dozens of papers since then showing just how toxic fructose is. They showed a study in kids where they could actually reverse a metabolic syndrome and fatty liver disease called a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Because, it, again, again, going back to the 1990s when, uh, you know, they replaced meat and fat with a bunch of plants and sugar because everything tasted like crap. So they added sugar to everything. Um, all of a sudden, you had 10-year-olds getting adult onset diabetes, which is what type 2 diabetes used to be called. And they were getting fatty liver disease, which was only seen in alcoholics up until that point. And so they were like, how is a kid getting adult onset diabetes? He's 10. He's not an adult. How is he getting adult onset diabetes? I remember, I actually remember a news program where they were saying that. How is he getting a, uh, di adult onset diabetes when he's 10? He's not an adult. And how is it that he has alcoholic fatty liver disease when only alcoholics get fatty liver disease because he's hey, never had alcohol? Can you that down a little? Oh. Sorry? I was just asking my wife to turn something down. Oh, and yeah. I, I just... Uh, but I thought my mic was mute, <laughs> muted. No, that's okay. That's all right. And so, um, you know, they, they, so they looked at that and said, okay, well, these kids are, you know, this, this is a kid, you know, he's getting adult onset diabetes. He's getting out, he's getting fatty liver disease. We normally see this in alcoholics. So instead of thinking for two seconds and saying, okay, well, what the hell has changed? What have we done to ourselves? What have you done to these kids? What are they, what's going on in their environment that may be influencing this? They just said, you know, it's probably happening all the time. You know, we probably just didn't notice it. And so instead of using their brain for literally one second, they decided to just rename it type 2 diabetes and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Well, it's not non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It is fructose fatty liver disease. When you eat fructose, you get this fatty fatty deposits in your liver. I, I was actually taught that in, in our biochemistry segment in medical school. This was, this was a, a well-established fact at the time. And so... Uh, Dr. Robert Lustig, who's a professor emeritus at, at UCSF, he did a, a series of experiments, you know, dozens of these things, and uh, very, very, very interesting stuff. He's written a number of papers and a number of books on this as well. And one of his experiments was, was with kids with metabolic syndrome and fatty liver disease, and he found that, that they could reverse fatty liver disease and metabolic syndrome by just replacing fructose with glucose, right? So instead of donuts, they were eating bagels right? And they still were eating the same amount of calories. In fact, when some kids were like losing weight, they're like, you eat more, eat more. We don't want this to be blamed on just weight loss. Well, they lost weight. Therefore, you know, they, they, you know, reversed their metabolic syndrome. Like, no, 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 no. You don't want anyone losing weight. So we told these kids to, to eat more or they told those kids to eat more. And so they were able to reverse metabolic syndrome and fatty liver disease in these kids by eating the same amount, 
same amount of calories, not losing weight, just replacing fructose with glucose, right? And so, and that actually met the Bradford Hill criteria for uh, causation. So that that was actually a causative study. They they showed causation. This was not correlation. They showed causation. And so that's what fructose does to you. Fructose damages your body like alcohol, and is addictive and damages your brain like meth. So I mean, this is a this is a hard drug, and this is something that absolutely should be. I mean, I don't I don't touch the stuff, uh, but I think it's absolutely something that you should never get around children. Oh, but they like it. Yeah, of course they do. You're, they're going to like cocaine too. You don't give it to them. You know, like it's that that's it's a drug. Of course they like drugs. Everyone likes drugs. You know, <laughs> they're designed that you like them. You do them. You go, oh, that gives me a good response. I like that. I want more of that. Right. But there's a serious detriment uh, that goes on goes along with that. And so, you know, it, you know, historically, coming across from fructose, we recognize that as safe. We got a quick hit of energy, and then we could go on with our day. But you know, this was seasonal. Like in in you know, the majority of, of human history, we we were you know, half the time we were in ice ages and a lot of people were up in the ice sheets. So they they had no access. To fruit and honey and things like that, and fructose containing, uh, you know, different uh, plants, right? And the ones that they did, you know, it was still seasonal, you know. So maybe it was you know a week or two out of the year they had some access to fruits, and these were very different fruits as well. You know, we've bioengineered and bred the fruits that we have now to be much, much more sweet. I mean, just tens to hundreds of times more sugar and fructose in them that um, that they would have ever had uh, in in you know as a natural plant, you know, and if you look up the different natural plants, where these plants come from, they're very different, like a natural mango. It's very, very, you know, uh, tough, it's got a bunch of big husk and a lot of fiber, very mildly sweet at best. And it's all just, it's all seed and fiber. Like that's it. That's not what we eat now. That is not what a mango is now, but that's not what we would have. That's not what our ancestors would have had historically. They're not very sweet at all. So we wouldn't have had much of it. Um, but it would have given you a bit of a, a quick hit of energy. We would have recognized it as safe and that's fine. That, that helps, uh, confer a survival advantage for that time. But right now it's, it's not so great. So we're having this in abundance. We're, we're having this not seasonally. We're having this daily. In fact, you have, have you know, your five servings of fruit and veg and things like that. So we're saying every single day you should be eating fruit. Well, that doesn't make any sense because our ancestors would never have had access to fruit on a daily basis. And in fact, I was speaking to a colleague of mine um, who was a doctor over in India, and he, uh, when I was going through before, I, you know, went back to carnivore, but I was, you know, researching this stuff in, into fructose and how toxic this stuff was. And we were talking about it. And he said, you know, actually, that's really interesting because there's a province in uh, India where he's from where the mangoes in, you know, a certain time of year, for about three months out of the year, they're so plentiful, just the wild mangoes that. And these are the you know the cultivated super sweet ones. They've just gone gone wild. That there's so many wild mangoes that basically the entire population of this area just for three months just eats mangoes, and that's all they eat. And maybe they'll eat some other things, but they're just eating tons and tons and tons of mangoes. And this is the area that has the highest rates of type two diabetes in in India. And in fact, the government had to restrict them and say, hey, you're not allowed to eat all these mangoes. You have to eat other things as well. You have to you know limit to a certain amount. I, I don't remember what what it was, but you know, so you can get these problems from from uh, fruit. You know, that's not that's not safe. You know, you can you can absolutely overdo it. And if you're eating juices and sodas and things like that, it's even worse. And that is why everything contains sugar, fructose containing sugar, because the sugar companies damn well know that this stuff is addictive. The food companies absolutely know this, and so they're pumping in all this sugar into all these different sorts of foods in order to make us addicted. Baby formula has a high fructose content, has a bunch of you know high fructose corn syrup. And you know what's that doing to a kid, right? You know, this this is causing you know different sorts of damage and addictive nature to adults. This is implicated in things like Alzheimer's, which is a degradation of an adult mature healthy brain. What's that doing to a baby's brain? What's that doing to a developing brain or a fetus? It's not going to be good. Right, that's not something that you want influencing your kid. That's not something you want anywhere near your child, and that's why the sh the food companies just dump this into everything because it's addictive. 
They put it in a formula because it's addictive and kids will want more. They want more. They want more. They'll cry. They'll scream out. I want more. I want more. And, uh, and now we're all the different foods we eat. We're highly addictive. They're highly processed, highly palatable, and they all have sugar in it. And that's why they have sugar. This is, this is not a mistake. This is not by happenstance. They know exactly what's going on. This is the new opium trade. This is a big drug cartel and they're pumping this into everything in order to addict us and make us buy more and consume. And the food companies are heavily invested in the pharmaceutical companies and the pharmaceutical companies are heavily invested in the food companies. Now, why would that be a good idea? The food that we're eating is causing the illnesses that they're treating. And Goldman Sachs had a leaked uh, slide from one of their one of their uh, high end meetings that says, you know, is it a viable, is it really a viable uh, business model to uh, you know to to cure uh, patients, or should we just you know perpetuate this disease state for decades? You know, get you know they're talking about putting teenagers on statins now. They're talking about, you know, if you have borderline hypertension, oh, we got to get these people on, on blood pressure medications, even though there's no data for that. And also you just stop eating carbs, it goes away uh, for most people. You know, so they're, they're doing the best they can to make these chronic diseases that you need to take medication daily for decades. They don't care about health. They don't care about you. They don't care about your family. They don't care about your kids. They care about coming up with something that they can sell on a daily basis to billions of people and start them off young and can keep and keep going. This is this is exactly the same uh, mentality as, as, as a drug cartel. They're trying to you know, get people hooked on this stuff early and keep them on it for the rest of their life. And they die young. Big deal. There'll be more people following them afterwards as long as they can they can make more kids. So this is this is nasty stuff. And this is why we as individuals and consumers have to be educated on this and we have to understand the history behind it, the science behind it, and just the simple biology that humans are carnivores and this is not how we're supposed to eat. You know, you go to the zoo, you ask any zookeeper, they'll tell you, you feed an animal something that it doesn't eat in the wild, something it didn't evolve on, it gets sick. But what does it get sick with? It gets obesity, heart disease, liver disease, diabetes, cancer, autoimmune diseases, and arthritis, right? Dogs and cats, known carnivores, and yet we give them grain and plant-based kibble and they get sick too they get those exact same diseases that we get that the zoo animals get you know this is why there are signs at the zoo and parks that say don't feed the animals it makes them very sick if they don't eat if they eat the wrong food don't feed the animals the thing that you're eating right now it makes them sick well it makes you sick too and so this is not something that we should be eating it's not something they should be eating and you and you talk to these people and you say you know you know, what happens if you if you give these zoo animals grains or human food, this and the other, and they say, if you feed animals it, human food, they get human diseases, right? These are non-communicable chronic diseases, right? They're not catching diabetes from it. It's not like they have a, they, you know, they have a bagel and all of a sudden, you know, diabetes becomes catching, right? It's that the bagel and whatever the hell they're eating is actually causing these things, right? So, we, you know, ancient Romans had lead pipes. They got lead poisoning. They didn't know what it was at first. They thought people were getting sick. They thought it was diseases. They thought it was a plague. They thought whatever, right? And eventually some bright spot figured out that actually, no, this is the, this is these pipes that we're using. And this is, this is poisoning us. There's something wrong here, right? So they figured that out. Well, we're in our lead pipes now. We're eating things and exposing ourselves to things that we have no business exposing ourselves to and we're getting sick and yet we haven't figured out yet that this is an exposure relationship we haven't figured out that you know the best thing to do is is remove the exposure right you know if you have lead poisoning yeah you can take some medications that help your symptoms because you get you get end organ damage you get brain damage you get body you know a body and, and organ damage as well right and so you can take some medic medicines that help you with that you know but the mainstay treatment is to recognize, hey, this is this is lead poisoning. This isn't just some weird autoimmune issue. This is this is lead poisoning, and to remove the exposure to lead. Well, that's what we're in now, and we need to recognize that these diseases, these chronic diseases, so-called, that we're treating nowadays, as a mainstay, like ninety percent of of money is spent treating chronic diseases. These chronic diseases are not diseases per se, but toxicities and malnutrition. Toxic buildup of a species inappropriate diet and a lack of species specific nutrition, namely too many plants we are not designed to eat 
uh, and biologically break down and detoxify safely and extract appropriate nutrients and not enough meat, which is where we get our nutrition and, uh, and our health from. So until we recognize that, until we recognize that these diseases are not diseases, that we're being poisoned and we need to remove this poison from our system, we are not going to get better. And the food companies are certainly not going to do it for us because they, they make way too much money on it. The, the pharmaceutical companies and the food industries make way too much money to ever tell us uh, what's going on. So we need to learn this ourselves. We need to understand this and just try it for yourself. Go for 30 days, go for three months, see what happens. Your life will change in ways you have no idea and you will be healthier and fitter and feel better than you ever have in your entire life. I can guarantee that. And you just see, this is, this is how we're supposed to live. This is how we're supposed to feel. And you will feel better for the first time in your life. And I remember looking back on my life at 38 after two weeks on a carnivore diet, realizing I felt like shit my entire life until right now and those five years in my early 20s. And I got pissed. I was like, I should have been feeling like this every single day of my life. I should have developed like this. I should be five inches taller. I should be 50 pounds heavier. I should be faster. You know, people used to be Olympic speed sprinters. There's, a, there's some uh, uh, fossil records of um, hunters running in, in Australia. There was on wet clay. This is wet, mushy, sandy clay, right? They were hunting down some sort of animal. One of those hunters was running at 37 kilometers an hour. That's Olympic sprinter speed with a spear chasing an animal on wet, sandy clay, right? That's what we're supposed to be. That's how we're designed. We're apex predators, top of the food chain. We are some of the most dominant animal species that has ever crossed this earth. And yet we're all fat and sick and falling apart. Why is that? Why are we the only squishy animal on earth? Oh, because they exercise more. No, they don't. Look at, look at uh, the zoo animals. They're in a box the size of this room. It's the definition of a sedentary lifestyle. And yet they're ripped. They look like they're on steroids. They're jacked. That's because they're eating what they're supposed to eat. And their bodies work the way you're supposed to eat. You, know, you mentioned that I probably worked out more today than you've worked out in the last several years. I haven't worked out in, in regularly in probably a year. You know, I don't have time. You know, I, I have a pretty insane schedule. Uh, when I work out, I try to I try to hit it hard, but I never get in worse shape than this. This is how I look. This is how human beings in in captivity look. You know, if you're eating your evolved diet. So this is this is zoo zoo animal human, right? And so I never go worse than this. It doesn't matter. And so. I can get a lot better. I can get a lot fitter. I can get a lot more muscular. Absolutely. But I never, I can get in a lot better shape, but I never get out of shape. And that's the thing. Our natural state as humans is one of health. Throughout all of history, we've been extraordinarily healthy, except when introducing these things that we're not supposed to eat. We used to call them diseases of the West. When the European explorers would go to uh, you know, uh, Australia and, and the Americas, they found that people weren't getting the diseases that the Western cultures were getting. And they, and they said, oh, these are diseases of the West. Only Western cultures get these things, right? Well, when they started incorporating, getting incorporated into Western society and they started eating Western food, they started getting Western diseases. In fact, I learned as a kid that when eating a Western diet, Native Americans are four times as likely to get obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and all the rest. And I remember thinking to myself, well, doesn't that mean the food's causing the disease? Because if they don't eat the food, they don't get the disease. And we eat the food and we get the disease, we just get it at a lower rate. And you know, what's a non-Western diet? What are they eating that we're not and vice versa? Well, you know, they didn't say it at the time, but they're pure high fat carnivores, right? Or predominantly so, you know, they, if they had meat, they ate meat. And that's what all the records show as well. You know, even when they had access to plant foods, even when they had access to you know, thawed uh, out vegetation, they ate meat. That's what they preferred, and they were much, much more healthy. And now they're much less healthy because they haven't had exposure to agriculture for ten thousand years like Europeans and other other cultures have, right? So they don't have built up the slightly better defenses against these plant toxins like you know you or I would, right? So they're far worse off when eating a Western diet, and they do far better. Uh, as a result, comparatively, when when eating uh, a meat only diet, but we all will thrive on a meat only diet because we're all humans, we're all Homo sapiens sapiens, and you cannot find 
a single example in nature of two members of the same species who have different optimal diets. It doesn't exist. If you have different optimal diets, you are a different species, full stop. I, I challenge anyone to find an exception to that. So there are people that are better or worse able to tolerate suboptimal food, but there is no two human beings that have different optimal diets biologically. It just, I don't think that that can happen. So, you know, that's, that's where we stand. You know, if you want to get your health back, if you want to get your life back, if you want to be, you know, not be beholden to the hospitals and the pharmaceutical uh, industries and be, you know, taking multiple pills a day, this is something you should consider and see for yourself. And some people say, well, it's very restrictive. You know, you're not eating all this variety. I want to eat X, Y, and Z. It's not restrictive at all. Heart disease is restrictive. Cancer is restrictive. Alzheimer's restrictive. Crippling di diabetes and depression are restrictive. Taking 30 medications a day is restrictive. Having to have a timer set every four hours so you can take your pills is restrictive. You know, being set on the couch so you can't, you know, get up because your back and your hips hurt so bad, that's restrictive. You know, eating meat is liberating. Eating meat is is freeing. I, I've, I've, I haven't eaten in two days. It's been 48 hours. I feel fine. You know, I probably have too much energy, right? And I all that time was my own. I wasn't cooking, thinking about, or eating food, right? I've just I've just been doing things. I've been getting I've been getting busy, being busy, working, uh, you know, and uh, and and doing all the things that I need to do. My time is my own. That's very freeing. I eat every now and then. I eat as much as I want. I eat exactly what I want. The only thing I want to eat is a steak anyway. That's the best damn thing I could think of. On, on, you know, even when I was not doing this, all I wanted to eat was steak anyway. Now it's the only thing I can, uh, that I eat. It's the only thing I want to eat. And I feel absolutely fantastic for it. And I encourage, and this is why I encourage people to, to at least try it out themselves because I've seen massive, massive benefits in my own life. I have seen clear demonstration of its, of its supremacy in the literature. And I've seen my parents, my family, and my patients, and thousands of people that I've worked with over the years massively benefit their health, come off most, if not all of their medications, shed weight like it's going out of style and massively increase their performance and their longevity. I had a guy, you know, just to, just to end on this, I had a guy who was, um, uh, that I was, I was told by a friend of mine who's a geriatrician here in uh, Perth, who she had a patient who's 86 years old, checked himself into a nursing home because he just wasn't able to, to, to live at home. He wasn't able to cope and survive. And so he had to go into a nursing home and care facility to basically care for him until he died. He was going there to die. And he sort of as a, as a last ditch attempt to regain his, his uh, independence and his life, he uh, found the carnivore diet. And um, you know, he started looking at it and said, okay, I'm gonna give this a try. In three months, he was back living home fully independently he was lifting weights three days a week, was swimming two days a week, and was off all medications. Three months. That's the power of this. At 86 years old, he had checked himself into a nursing home to die. And now he's back home living his life. He's fully independent. They literally gave him his life back. You know, so it's never too late. It's never a bad time to stop eating poison. And that's why I'm I'm as passionate as I am about this. You know, if if you see the hundreds of millions of people who have been billions of people who've been led astray by these recommendations over the past 40 years, the hundreds of millions of people who have, who have been sickened for decades and died early, we've all been touched by that. Every single one of us has someone in our families who has died of one of these chronic illnesses that honestly should not has, have never come about in the first place. We've all been hit by this. And the hundreds of millions of people, the billions of people around the world that have been affected by this, you know, is, is just absolutely criminal and like if you can't get passionate about something like that I, I don't think you can get passionate about anything well i'll tell you um you know your story about high fructose corn syrup and 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 we didn't even get into seed oils or anything and then mm -hmm. we didn't get into cancer so I, I was actually i was going to follow up about cancer and glucose and then and a week, yeah. and, and even high performance but it is it is getting late. If you want to stay, I can certainly stay. I'm it's early in the morning here, and no, it's late happy. You. you know what? Then let's talk about it because the other right. thing that people are scared shit about is 
this is going to cause cancer. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a very, you'll know everything about it, but then there's also a gentleman at, uh, at Boston college that, uh, mm-hmm. knows a hell of a lot about it. And, um, could you get Absolutely. into some of, the, some of the cancer stuff? And then if you're free, we'll get in, then we'll get into high performance. I wanted to debunk all the shit. Mm-hmm. Before people said, Oh yeah, you know, you're going to be, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatever, because you don't eat, you know, you're not eating carbohydrates, but is, how's that long-term health going to be? So I wanted to get rid of the long-term yeah. health concerns before we got into the, uh, and cancer being one of them. And, and you could just tell everybody what cancer cells need and, <laughs> but they don't get on a carnivore diet. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, and, and just your point about Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, he, he sold out by going on the, the game changes thing and, and, uh, trying to sell, uh, James Cameron's, um, you know, pea protein, you know, that, that he's the executive producer of, uh, James Cameron's the executive producer of, uh, game changers and, uh, where you're pushing this vegan diet and just happens to own $140 million worth of a pea protein company. So, oh, Hey, you don't eat meat, but Hey, you need protein. And what do you know? I, I've, I've got, I've got the solution right here. So that was just a giant commercial and it was a complete fraud as well. And people have gone through that and done critiques and shown how just ridiculous it is. But, Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he was actually doing his, his uh, you know, bodybuilding days, he, he was eating steak and eggs, steak and eggs, steak and eggs, because that was the teaching at the time of the golden era bodybuilders from Vince Garanda and Serge Nubre. They just ate meat. His body idol was Serge Nubre, who was a, a French bodybuilder, big dude, look him up, N-U-B-R-E-T. Uh, this guy is jacked. He was jacked up until he was in his 70s when, when he actually died of uh, foul play. Uh, and uh, that guy would eat six pounds of horse meat a day. And Arnold got his inspiration from him. He's like, oh, I'm just going to eat steak, steak, steak. So, and, and he talked about it in, in Pumping Iron. He's like, yeah, you got to eat all these steaks. You got to eat all the protein. But, you know, I can't eat it all at one time. So I've got to eat a steak here. He makes there, another steak here, another steak there, another steak there. It was never vegetables. It was, oh, I got to get my celery. I've got to get my, you know, my, my beet root. And I've got all this. It was steaks. He ate steaks. And that's what all the golden era bodybuilders ate. And that's how they got, you know, massive, massive physiques before the steroid era. And so as far as cancer is concerned, well, we touched on the fact that meat does not cause cancer. In fact, all those studies were, were again, from the University of Washington just last year, shown to be extremely weak and uh, or extremely shoddy, lazy studies or fraudulent bias studies. And there are a number of reasons for that. There's a lot of weird uh, uh, things going back. Well, a you have the industry trying to protect its its um, you know its progress uh, its product in in sugar, and so they they took meat as a scapegoat, and they're trying to vilify that. But also a lot of the a lot of the uh, nutritional research that comes out is done by the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Kellogg cereal, Kellogg Dr. Kellogg was a Seventh Day Adventist, and the Seventh Day Adventists are religiously anti meat. And uh, they had a prophetess in the late 18. It's all true. You all look it up. They had a prophetess in the late 1800s who had a vision from God and uh, found that you know had said that God spoke to her and said that you, we, everyone has to stop eating meat because it's sinful because it makes you lustful. It makes people want to procreate because you're healthy and your hormones work. And uh, so that's bad because lust is a sin and therefore meat is sinful. Meat is evil. And you have to stop eating it. And so they were pushing this hard. Kellogg's was her protege, and he just was mind warped from an early age uh, into, into this way of thinking. And he came up with Kellogg's cornflakes, which was designed to suppress people's hormones and make them less, you know, feral. Right. So, you know, this was this was something that uh, they did on purpose to try to suppress good health. That was that was the actual goal. And so whether they thought about it in that way or not, that's what it was. That's what it was doing. So he found in Kellogg's, um, you know, uh, cereals. And now this is one of the largest corporations. You know, have those things over like, like the seven companies that own everything. Kellogg's is one of them. And the Seventh Day Adventists actually founded the field of nutritional research and, and, and dietetics in the university level, I think, in 1917. And then they wrote the first textbook on nutritional sciences for university courses in uh, 1925. It's still in print. The, it's like the 50th edition, but it's still in in the uh, in the universities, right? So they have hundreds of institutions around the world. They pump out millions 
every single year of nutritional research and they and it's pushing this agenda it's pushing this plant-based agenda that meat is evil meat is bad and so this is this is just fraud and the university of washington showed this and went through these studies and said these are all crap you can just throw them out there is no evidence that meat causes cancer specifically and 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 uh in particular uh unprocessed red meat so that's out you don't have to worry about that now go back to the plants i learned in cancer biology two decades ago that there are dozens if not over a hundred known carcinogens in vegetables that we eat these are not the pesticides that we're spraying on them this is the plant themselves so it doesn't matter if you've grown in your own garden there's research out of university of california berkeley from a professor bruce ains that in uh published in 1989 showing that um that there were ten thousand times more naturally occurring pesticides and insecticides in the plant itself by weight then the pesticides we sprayed on them, right? These natural defense chemicals that the plants were making to stop animals and insects from eating them, right? And that's why we spray pesticides on things. It's to stop animals and insects from eating them. And they found that just the toxins, the natural toxins in mushrooms, just white mushrooms, normal table mushrooms, that they were 500 times more likely to cause cancer than the pesticides we were spraying on them. In this case, ALAR was the pesticide they were comparing this against. So. Meat does not have any carcinogens. So I say, oh, well, you cook it, you burn it. Okay, don't burn it. I mean, that's stupid, right? So you don't have to burn it uh, if you're worried about that. But also the studies that that show that these burnt byproducts are carcinogenic were done in in, in lab animals. They were not done in humans, and they were also done in in you know concentrations thousands of times greater than what you'd get in in a in you know burnt steak, right? So it's not really comparable. But you know. Just don't burn it. If, if you're worried about it, just don't burn it. And so um, so there's that. There's no carcinogens in meat. There are definitely carcinogens in plants. Okay. So what causes cancer? Well, there's a lot of different different uh, theories on this. Um, I think it's you know, maybe genetic. But in fact, there's, there's strong evidence to show this is actually a metabolic mitochondrial disease. And this was the original uh, and foremost theory on cancers done uh, put forward by Dr. Otto Warburg, who was a Nobel Prize winner in uh, medicine and physiology. And he did decades of work on cancer and found that there was a strong uh, connection with the mitochondria and found that all cancers had, all cancer cells had damaged mitochondria that couldn't go through oxidative phosphorylation properly and had to go through for a fermentive process to make ATP, which is the energy for the cell. And so you had these damaged mitochondria, they didn't work properly, and you can you can see this in all cancer cells. And you, even cancer cells, first of all, not all cancer cells have genetic changes. So we say, oh, these genetic changes, but you know, if you look at a, at a tumor, you, you, you look at all the individual cells, they all have different genes. A lot of them are normal genetics. In fact, there are, there are some cancers that have no genetic changes at all. So how can this be a purely genetic disease if there are no genetic changes and yet it's still cancer? They all have damaged mitochondria. And so uh, Otto Warburg uh, wrote a paper in 1957 called uh, The Origins of Cancer. And this was after 30 years of research on the subject. And he argued and showed evidence for the fact that this is coming from your mitochondria. First of all, your mitochondria stop your, uh, when they're healthy, they regulate cell division and growth. And when, and they also uh, carry out apoptosis. So if, you, if your cell says, okay, look, something's going wrong, something's screwy, we just need to end it here, the mitochondria then action that, okay? So if the mitochondria are damaged, they can't then self-suicide, right? Which is, which is a hallmark of cancer cells. And also, you get unregulated cell division and growth, which is also the definition of cancer, right? And so that's where you get this from. Well, so what do we do once we have, well, first of all, how do you avoid getting cancer? Well, you reduce inflammation and you reduce things that damage mitochondria. A lot of these plant toxins damage your mitochondria, and that's what makes them carcinogenic. A lot of these uh, genetic disorders and predispositions that people have for cancer a lot of these things damage the mitochondria as well. A lot of these carcinogens and other sorts of you know industrial toxins that that we know cause cancer damage the mitochondria. And then there's this 
you know, down, uh, downstream uh, issues from there. They create a lot of free radicals and a lot of damage. They can cause genetic um, changes in the, in the cell as well. Um, but it, it all stems from the mitochondria. How do we know this? Well, you see those associations, but you also, there has been experiments that show that when you take the nucleus of a cancer cell with all the genetic changes of cancer and you put it into a normal cell, does not behave as cancer. You could actually clone it and turn it into, you know, mice and frogs or whatever you got it from. And that's what they did. But if you take the damaged uh, mitochondria out of a uh, cancer cell and you put that into a healthy cell with normal DNA, it does behave as cancer. And you can't clone it. It'll just die off. You can't, you can't use it. It's, it's a, this is cancer. It doesn't work. And then if you take healthy mitochondria and you put that into a cancer cell, it suppresses the cancer, right? So that's pretty pretty good evidence that this is not a genetic issue, that this is actually a mitochondrial metabolic disease. And that's, uh, you know, the person you alluded to is a professor, Thomas Seafried from uh, Boston College, who I've done an interview with. I've had him on my podcast. Extraordinarily interesting guy. Honestly, I think that, that you know, once this is shown that this is actually, you know, what's going on, I think he'll be in line for, a, he'll be on the short list for a Nobel Prize um, for, from all of his work on this. So, Avoiding cancer, avoid things that damage your mitochondria, do things that help your mitochondria. Well, we have studies that show that people on a ketogenic diet, which a carnivore diet is, uh, after you know a few months, you have four times the number of mitochondria, and they are four times as effective and healthy, right? Because when you're in ketosis, when you're on a ketogenic diet, you actually recycle your old cells, you recycle, uh, it's called you know autophagy, and you recycle your old organelles like your mitochondria, it's called mitophagy. So you have older, damaged, slowing down mitochondria, and you replace them with new, younger, healthy mitochondria, and you stimulate the production of more mitochondria. So this is very, very good for your metabolism and for protecting you from cancer. And it's also when you have different religious uh, groups and different people that fast, you know, this has shown that these populations tend to have less chronic diseases, tend to have less cancer rates, tend to do better when they when they do run into cancer. And there's a lot of other things that go into it as well, of course. But let's say you have cancer. Well, again, all these cancers have these damaged mitochondria that don't function properly, can't make energy properly. So how do they make energy? Because they actually have a much higher metabolic demand, right? Well, they go through this substrate level fermentation of glucose, but also glutamine. Um, but a lot of these things take glucose, right? But, but they're less efficient at it. So they actually, and they have a higher metabolic rate. And so they actually require 400 times the amount of glucose than a normal cell does, right? So if you're eating carbohydrates, this is just, this is just, dumping gasoline on the fire of your cancer, right? So if you go on a ketogenic diet, carnivore diet uh, being, I think, the best version of this, then you will limit the amount of glucose available, right? You'll still have blood, you're still going to make blood sugar. But, you know, if your ketones are up and you're eating a lot of fat, your actually glucose will be relatively low and so you'll have less available uh, glucose, for these cancer cells, and it just starves them out. You know, I mean, we, we do PET scans, a PET CT. You know, we give uh, a you know radio opaque, radio radio marked uh, glucose molecules. We give that injection to people, and what do you know? It goes into these areas of high metabolic rate, and that cancer cells or the cancer bodies just light up, right? Well, that's because it's sucked in a whole a whole bunch of glucose, right? So you don't want to do that. Do not give yourself an injection of glucose, right? And then it won't have this big, big uptake in the cancer cells, right? So you can limit the amount of energy that's available to those cells. Also, you're improving the microenvironment, you're improving the cellular environment of these mitochondria. And, you know, who knows, you can kill off these cells, but the cells around it aren't quite fully damaged. They might be able to reverse and repair their mitochondria as well. Also, there's a study, there were two studies done, one in uh, 2019, another in 2020, that showed that people on a ketogenic diet actually had better outcomes with chemo and radiation. They found that the cancers were more sensitive to chemo and radiation when on a ketogenic diet. And they found that the native cells, your healthy cells, were actually more protected from chemo and radiation. So the cancer cells were getting targeted more and your, your own native cells were actually uh, uh, being able to weather this better, which is, you know, 
some people die from the chemo and not the cancer. And that's a very, very, very sad situation to be in. So that's one of these main things. You want to give yourself the best option possible and the best chance possible. This is something I think that the evidence is, is very clear on that being on a ketogenic diet, carnivore diet being, being the best example of this is going to give you a very good shot. A, because it's going to help your body fight the cancer anyway. B, because it's going to sensitize the cancer to chemo and radiation and protect you from chemo and radiation. And this is something we're seeing. We are seeing this in randomized controlled trials in humans and in, in rats showing that going on a ketogenic diet, a calorie-restricted ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet is gives a it gives a survival advantage and the less carbohydrates the better some of these some of these studies show that you will well that you can you can have as much as 50 grams of carbohydrates a day they don't do as well as the ones who are limited to 20 grams a day or zero grams a day you know the less carbohydrates the better and so you know there are more and more studies coming out in my particular field in neurosurgery there are you know, about two dozen uh human trials on this they're smaller studies but bigger but they've been successful enough to encourage people to do larger studies so more and more studies are coming out now larger studies out of out of uh, cedar sinai medical center in the u.s you know they're, they're coming out with a you know fa um you know phase two trial uh, with ketogenic metabolic therapy and uh to see you know getting larger and larger and larger populations with people with glioblastoma brain cancer and you know, and and just to, to see exactly what's going on with more and more people in the preliminary studies, they're working well, and there are can, and there are, are case reports and case series when people have far outlasted the the averages and the norms. And in animal models, you know, we we see clear uh, evidence of benefit. And then other things like uh, triple negative breast cancer. This is very sensitive to ketogenic diet, and it works very very well. The reason that some cancers are more or less sensitive to a ketogenic diet is because, as I mentioned, they run on glucose, but they also run on glutamine, which is an amino acid, which we all make and is in every protein source, plant or animal. And so, you know, you're eating this stuff, you're going to get glutamine in and uh, some run on more glucose or some run on more glutamine. And so for GBM brain cancer, glioblastoma, 75% of the cancer cells energy come from, um, come from uh, glutamine. And so, the most successful trials in animals have been where they used ketogenic diet for the rats and gave them an agent to basically interrupt the metabolism of glutamine as well. And they found that their rats didn't die. They had a 100% survival. And then when they autopsied them and looked at their cancers under the microscope, they were just dead, just dead cells. Just wipe these things out because they just didn't have energy. They couldn't, they couldn't survive. They just died out. And so, you know, that's a very, very promising uh, future for this. You know, I think that's probably why fasting can be beneficial in, in cancer because you're not, you're not bringing in glucose, you're also not bringing in glutamine. You make some glucose, you make some glutamine, so this is not a perfect situation, but you are severely limiting the, the, the food supply for these things. And as a result, you know, people are doing better, and that's obviously what we want. And so, yeah, and and, and I, I did want to, you, you touched on everything, which was, which was brilliant that cancer basically eats glucose and, yeah. that, uh, and it is a mitochondrial disease, but also the fact that fasting and, 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 and even a zero carb diet isn't a hundred percent perfect because your liver does produce glucose and, mm -hmm. and that's how come, um, uh, is it the free, freeze, the free, is it free? Has it, how do you say, say his last name, the guy from BC? Oh, Seafried. Uh, Seafried. Dr. Seafried from, they they couple it, like you said, with with some inhibitory drugs, especially in terms of what insulin can do to you. Because insulin is, insulin is something that, while well, as a savior, is also a, uh, a murderer. So, well, you know, I, yeah. Yeah, well, I was, I was just going to say as well, one of, one of the things that I... Um, I found out early or recently as well. Um, it's just some papers that came out recently, and I spoke with a guy, Dr. Sean O'Mara, uh, who's uh, you know he's a, he's an emergency physician, but he's also switched into nutritional research. 
And he found a very strong relationship between visceral fat and a lot of metabolic diseases because visceral fat is metabolically active and, and can cause very serious metabolic harm. And so he did a study, uh, I think it was, it was uh, you know, a grant from the, like the NIH that uh, I believe it was NIH that uh, they looked at, they did over 8,000, or sorry, 6,000 MRIs of the abdomen looking at visceral fat and looking at, at uh, myosteatosis, which is basically mar human marbling, right? You know, you, you feed a bunch of grains to cows and they get marbling, they get that, that fat marbling in the, in the meat. We get the exact same thing. You feed a, a cow a bunch of grains and carbs to get that marbling, that exact same process is happening to you because again, your blood sugar goes up, your body goes, sweet Jesus, what has this idiot done? Slams up your insulin and this stuffs energy into every other orifice in your body. One of them is, is by depositing intramuscular fat. And this is why you know bodybuilders and things like that, oh, we'll eat all this carbs. They get big and swollen, puffy muscles, right? But it's, it's, it's fat and water weight, right? Fat, glycogen, and, and water that is attached to the glycogen, right? And then they go in a cutting phase and they lose 80 pounds and they go, oh, my muscles shrank. No, they didn't. They were never there in the first place. That was just fat and water. And so, you know, he found that people with reducing their visceral fat confer massive, massive health benefits. And he found that the best diet to do that was a carnivore diet. And the best exercise for that was sprinting and weightlifting. This high interval, in, you know, high interval, um, you know, intensity interval training, and uh, so sprinting, weightlifting, carnivore diet. Those are the three things that can improve your visceral body fat, improve your overall health the most. That he found in this study with over six thousand people, and interestingly, uh, Trinity College in Dublin, where you know Tony Smith is the rugby coach at, and um, they just they just published a paper this year that showed that. First of all, people that are overweight have more body fat, in particular visceral fat, have higher rates of cancer and higher rates of death from cancer. So they have worse outcomes. And so, you know, there are a lot of other things. Maybe they're doing a lot of things that are causing them to be sick, which is also causing them to be overweight. <laughs> yeah, drinking, smoking, all that stuff. But one of the things they actually found that the actual visceral fat itself made you more likely to die from cancer or more likely to get cancer was because they actually sequester one of our most important uh, immune cells for this, which is our natural killer T cells, NK T cells. And so these are our first line defense against cancer cells. You know, people have little different precancerous cancerous cells popping up all over our body all the time. And these are the guys going around seeking and destroying saying, hey, get this little bastard, get that out of there before it causes a problem. And, when you have more visceral fat, there, it's directly correlated. So there's a, you know, there's a linear association with more visceral fat, less natural killer T cells, NK T cells. And so when you have someone who has more visceral fat, they're going to have more cancer. They're going to have worse outcomes from cancer because you have this big part of your immune system. This is not just chemo fighting cancer. Your body is fighting cancer. Your biochemistry and your biology is fighting cancer. And so, you know, you, you disrupt, you take one of those, those legs of the stool out, you're in trouble. And so, again, the best way to reduce visceral fat, carnivore diet, sprinting, lifting weights. Now... I think that we can, if you, if you have time, we can safely yeah. get into, and so there's a couple, couple of, couple of, the, safely get into high performance eating. So there's a couple of things. I have two, two of my friends. One of them was my, was a, a, my prop in, in college, who's a doctor who's going to do my blood work after mm -hmm. I haven't. I haven't had blood work since my surgery, so or I did. I, I give I give blood or give I actually give platelets most of the time because it's they're harder to it's a pain in the ass to give platelets and I have time to do it. So, but most of the time, it, so he he's a wrestling coach and a football guy now, and so and then I have another really good friend whose daughter is is a one of the top high school wrestlers in the country. Nice. So, and then we have the rugby community which of course we all love. And that's my, my passion, high performance eating, wrestling tournaments, track, track. And I have a track coach who's a, a cross country guy and high performance eating carnivore diet. Why we do this. You and I both, everybody used to think I was crazy. I didn't eat on the day of the game. I just yeah. didn't eat. Never. And I played, 
That's the way I did it. I just, when I ate, I felt sluggish for whatever reason. It was, I didn't have any scientific reason and or anything like that. And then after the game, I would drink myself stupid. And <laughs> so, so I'd be, you know, I wouldn't eat. And I'd drink myself stupid. And then, uh, so anyway, but that all said, that's not the high performance part. And and, uh, <laughs> and and believe me, I wasn't performing all that great anyway. <clears throat> so let's just let's just say, in those situations, debunk some myths, please. Talk about how whether or not this is good. Should they have carbohydrates? Why shouldn't they? And you know that this this is going to be something that will be. It's of interest to me too. And 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 I've heard your talks on it. But it still is of interest to me. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I think it's so important. I mean, first of all, let's go back to our biology. This is how we're supposed to eat. And so, if you're eating optimally, your body's going to work optimally. And just like those those you know Olympic level track athletes that were hunting down you know some sort of you know wild game on wet sand, you know running at Olympic sprinter speed, you know that's how our bodies are designed. And so they were eating what they're supposed to eat and their bodies are working the way they're supposed to eat. They're not, they're not doing, you know, sprinting drills and all these sorts of things. They're just going out and they're just hitting it. You know, they've got something in front of them. They just, they're just going to chase it down. So you can think about that from, from first principles, you know, where we come from, what our background is, what our biology is. But there are actually a lot of studies and there's a lot of biochemistry and physiology to support this. Um, if people want to go like do a really deep in-depth look, they can go to uh, Professor Tim Noakes, N-O-A-K-E-S. He's a he's a professor of uh, you know sports medicine uh, from uh, South Africa. He was one of the main exercise physiology uh, sports medicine uh, doctors in the world for decades, and he was one of these guys who said, "Hey, you got to eat carbs. You got to eat carbs to fuel you know fuel the the, the engine." You got to eat carbs or bird carbs. He was that guy. He, he promoted that. And then he actually found out like, ooh, actually, I think I've been lying to people for 30 years. Like, this isn't right. You actually don't need this. You actually don't want it. It's actually better uh, to not eat carbohydrates as a high performance athlete, which is specifically who he's working with, right? So he's done actually a number of interventional trials, adding in, taking out carbohydrates and watching people's performance. And they say, oh, well, you need carbs to uh, to perform at your best. No, you don't. In fact, you perform just as well if you make your own carbohydrates yourself and you don't run out of energy because you're producing carbohydrates from your fat stores. And so you never run out of glycogen. You're always replenishing your glycogen constantly. Your body's very, very good at this. And think about it this way. You know, we all know in the athletic community, or we've heard that – you know, when you push yourself, you push yourself, eventually you're going to hit the wall and you're going to run out of gas and you're just going to, you know, be pretty rough, you know. And so most people stop there. And but other people and I'm sure you've been there. I'm sure our listeners have been there. I've been there. You know, if you push yourself and you push yourself, you can break through the wall. And if you break through the wall, you get your runners high, you get your second wind and you and you can just go forever and you just feel amazing and you just go 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 is this this mythical sort of thing that everyone talks about like oh you can you can break through the wall it's this crazy thing but it, it's true i've experienced that i'm sure you know you and others have experienced that as well what that is biochemically is you're eating carbohydrates you built up all this glycogen maybe even carbo loaded i actually found that i i performed way better when i did not carbo load when i actually fasted didn't eat, eat dinner didn't eat breakfast, didn't eat lunch, and just played my game, fasted for 24 hours, I played way better, I had way more energy. Well, what happened? You know, you know, our my biochemistry was different. And so when you're hitting the wall, it's because you've eaten all these carbohydrates, your insulin is up. And again, your insulin's up, that's blocking your body's ability to access your fat stores. So you have a certain amount of glycogen in your muscles and in your liver. But it's it's finite. It, it's that's it. Once you've used it, it's done. And so you use all that up. Your blood sugar starts to drop. You can't mobilize anything else, and you feel miserable. You don't have energy. You feel like crap, and you just want to stop. But if and normally it takes about twenty four hours for that insulin level to come down, so you can start making blood sugar again and glycogen again. Which is why I naturally felt better when I didn't eat for twenty four hours before a game because my insulin was low. 
and now I'm making all the blood sugar that I need, and I felt amazing. But when you're when you push yourself and push yourself and push yourself, you are you will force yourself to get into uh, this this state where you can start making blood sugar and glycogen again, right? So you force yourself into that, and you just feel amazing. You have all this energy. You can just go forever because now you're tapped into your fat stores. Well, I live in my second wind. I'm always in my runner's high. So when I start working out, I feel amazing because I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make the exact amount of energy that I need. So sitting here talking to you, I'm making the exact amount of energy that I need to sit here and talk to you. When I start working out, when I start running, when I start lifting weights, my body produces the exact amount of energy that I need for whatever I'm demanding of it. And the reason we take stimulants, the reason we, that we, you know, drink coffee and things like that is because that causes us to burn more energy. When we burn more energy, we feel better. And so we like that. So people take all this stuff, we stimulate, so we burn a lot more energy, so we're awake, so we go hit the gym. I go to the gym so that I can wake up. I go to the gym so that I feel better because as I'm working out, I'm producing more energy, I'm burning more energy, and I feel better. It makes me want to work out harder, which makes me feel better, which makes me want to work out harder. And so it's this positive feedback loop that the harder I go, the better I feel. As I'm doing it, it's not like oh, I put in this hard work. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so glad that's over, but I feel better for having done it. No, I feel better as I'm doing it. And so I just want to go harder and harder and harder. And of course, you have a limit. Your, you know, your, your VO2 max, you're, you're, you're going to hit your, your respiratory limit. You're going to hit your, your uh, muscle limit, things like that. But you can go a hell of a lot harder than you ever have in your life. You can go a hell of a lot harder than your, than your peers or your competition. And as you're going, you know, you can do more and more and more and get fitter and faster and stronger at much faster than other people will as well. And so your performance absolutely goes crazy. And so just from a physiological biochemistry point of view, that it, it makes perfect sense that you would do that. And in practice, I can tell you that I, as a, as a player myself in my early 20s, when I was doing this, that, you know, I, you know in my late 20s, when I'm, you know, I'm bigger, I'm more muscular, I've got much more experience under my belt, I felt way better, had much more strength, much more endurance, much more stamina, and was a better player in my early 20s than I was in my late 20s or any other time. And so now, and I, you know, I'm 43 now, and my body still works amazingly well. And I can, I can work out and lift weights for hours, and I don't run out of gas, I don't run out of steam. The harder I go, the harder I want to go, and the longer I want to stay. I have to like limit myself because I don't have much time, you know. But when I do go to the gym, it's it's hard for me to drag myself out of there. I just want to keep going and keep going and keep going. I get much better results. I get much better recovery. And that's another thing too. This this pisses people off more than anything. Anytime I say any say that like all the different things I say, people are like, oh, okay, well maybe maybe not or whatever. But when I say this, people really seem to like lose their mind. I don't get sore. It doesn't matter how hard I work out. It doesn't matter how hard I push myself. It doesn't matter how many months it's been since I've lifted weights, did deadlifts or squats. I go in there, I hit it, and I do 20 sets of bench, 20 sets of squats, 20 sets of deadlifts. I'm not sore the next day. And that's because that soreness, stiffness, and swelling is these you know, defense mechanisms, these inflammatory factors that are in plants that are causing that pain, stiffness, and swelling. And I don't eat that stuff, and so I don't get sore. And that's something that, that really drives people crazy. But it's like, hey, do it yourself. Stop eating plants. Just eat meat. And in two weeks, you will not be getting sore anymore. Coffee, too. Coffee is a plant. Coffee, is, that's what's so bitter. It has all these defense chemicals in it. Caffeine is a neurotoxin. It was developed as an insecticide you know, for, to, to kill insects trying to eat it, right? And um, you know, so if you eat that stuff, you drink that stuff, you're going to get sore. You get, cut that out of your body for two weeks or so, you won't get sore. It doesn't matter how hard you work out. It doesn't matter how long it's been. And that is how our bodies are supposed to work. And as an athlete, high level or just wish you or, or, or aspiring to become one or just playing recreationally, this is the biggest advantage that I've ever seen in my entire life as an athlete and as a clinician. One of the most important, I mean, just just from a, from a, from another take, from another angle, I test people's bloods. I test people's hormones. You know, I have a practice outside of neurosurgery uh, where you know I'm, I'm able to incorporate more lifestyle interventions as well. And 
I see people's uh, blood results. I test, I test people's testosterone. I see people in their fifties, uh, sixties, and seventies. Men in their fifties, sixties, and seventies routinely increase their testosterone by thirty to forty percent in three months, right? And I've, I've had some having even more dramatic results. I had one guy. He was, uh, I think, he was early seventies, like seventy-two years old, and he doubled his testosterone. Got into to, to the range that you'd see in someone in their twenties. And he was just he was just charged with life. He said, I just feel amazing. You know, all I want to do is work out and have sex with my wife. I just feel amazing. Like he, he said, I feel like a teenager again. You know, hormonally, he was pretty close. And I've worked with a number of different athletes, top athletes, rugby players on the U.S. national team, uh, you know, playing in the MLR, uh, who don't even go all the way carnivore, but just go close, eating a lot more meat and a lot less of the other crap doubling their testosterone levels right what i mean people cheat they risk their lives they risk their health they risk their freedom and their ability to play in 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 organized uh you know in organized events and do you know to do steroids to give themselves an advantage all you have to do is stop eating these things that disrupt your hormones in the first place there are there are chemicals in plants that disrupt your hormones that are phytoestrogens estrogen mimic or soy has 20 times the amount of phytoestrogens uh, in it in three ounces of soy than a fertile woman makes in a day and you know dozens of times more estrogen than the birth control pill. So why in God's name are people eating this stuff, especially if you're an athlete, especially if you want to optimize your health and your hormonal health and want to get pregnant, you want to get your wife pregnant, something like that. This stuff is toxic. So all you have to do is get rid of that stuff that is disrupting your hormones and eat the things that help promote your hormones like red meat, fat, cholesterol, and your body will improve. I worked with a guy, I did a, a podcast with a guy named uh, uh, Ryan Talbot. He's uh, and so I have, I have two two interviews with him on my on my podcast channel on YouTube. It's just Anthony Chafee, MD. So if you want to look that up, we did uh, an interview last year about six months after he went carnivore and he finished uh, you know the Big Ten championship. He won the Big Ten NCAA Big Ten uh, championship for the decathlon um, last year out of Michigan State and earned All American honors at nationals uh, after that. This year he came in second at the Big Ten. And again, earned all American honors, right? So consistent performance, right? So I spoke to him uh, just after nationals uh, a few Are weeks ago. He's not eating Wheaties. Yeah, well, that's it, he's right? Not you know? Transition. That's it. And yeah, how can that's it. Yeah, got rid of Wheaties. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we just have to make you know, a new cereal called Beefies, you know, and then breakfast. That's a breakfast of champions. And um, so yeah, so he he was telling me that he wasn't feeling great before he went carnivore. He went to their team doctor and just said, hey, look, I'm not, I'm not feeling my best. I, I think something's wrong. You know, can you check it out? Checked all their blood results. He's like, yeah, you know, everything's fine. You know, there's nothing wrong here. You know, you're okay. And he's like, well, I don't feel okay. So obviously, you know, that's that's not helpful. And so he came across a carnivore diet. You know, I spoke with him early on. He sort of reached out to me and asked me some questions. And I helped him get going with it. And he started, you know, his athleticism sort of just took off. Just, just hit all new heights, and he, you know, he said that he was turning into just this, you know, a much better athlete. And he said to me that he was finally becoming the athlete that he always wanted to become, and he, his performance and his ability just started going crazy. And he was actually new to the decathlon. He was, he was not, he's not been doing the decathlon for ten years like other people have, and so he was actually new to to a lot of these events. And he won the Big Ten championship, set a school record. And as a two-time All-American, right? So big performances out of this kid. Obviously, very talented athlete and works very, very hard. But you know, he, uh, what he's saying himself is that this dietary change changed everything. Now he doesn't feel like he's sick. There's something wrong. Now he just feels amazing. He was actually saying to me uh, that he was having trouble because uh, he's actually it's actually too easy for him to put on muscle. He's like, when I work, I have to work out less because I put on muscle so fast that I'm like gaining weight. And you know you have your 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 strength to weight ratio. You know you can slow down a bit. He wants to be able to jump higher, run faster. So he's trying to keep his weight down. So he's like, oh, I actually have to work out less because I'm getting I'm getting so muscular. And he found on his more recent blood tests, they they checked his bloods this year, and uh, so about one year or so, maybe eighteen months after uh, his original blood test, well maybe a year. 
And they found that his testosterone level had gone from 700 something, like 720, up to 1150, right? So you have this 500 point plus bounce in his testosterone, and his and the team doctor was like, "Oh, yeah, that's um, that's that's a big jump. Maybe uh, you might uh, they might actually have to test you for that." And what do you know? The NCAA just did a did a so called random uh, drug test on him the next week, and uh, and test him. They were like, "Oh, well, yeah, oh, actually, no, everything's fine. This is all completely natural." And he's like, "Yeah, I know that. Thank you." And so, um, so that was it. So you want a performance advantage as an athlete. Well, you could do steroids and, and be an idiot and, and potentially ruin your life and your health and, you know, and, and lose your career as an athlete. Or you can eat a proper diet. You can eat meat. You can cut out all the other crap. And you will not only be able to lock into your fat stores and have limitless energy, unlike if you're eating carbohydrates, but you also maximize and optimize your, your hormones and your, your testosterone and growth hormone as, as well. This actually increases growth, growth hormone production uh, and growth hormone utilization. When you eat carbohydrates, your insulin goes up. Insulin blocks the production and function of growth hormone. Growth hormone is one of the most critical hormones in, in longevity, youth, and athleticism. You know, I mean, this is, you know, people take growth hormone as uh, for an anti-aging uh, from an anti-aging point of view, but also from a performance enhancing point of view. So, you know, if you want the benefits of these performance enhancing agents without the health detriments, because this is happening in balance, your body is doing this naturally. So everything else is is coming up along with it, right? This is This is pure health. If you want this and you don't want the risks and you don't want uh, you know the 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 problems with the legalities of it. This is the best thing that you could possibly do for yourself and your career. It is, I honestly, there there are quite a lot of pro, pro rugby players in in Australia in the NLR or NRL. Sorry, dyslexic. Yeah, the uh, the the rugby league down here. There are, there are plenty of them. I know they're doctors and. But they don't talk about it because this is a huge advantage for them. They don't want the competition knowing it, right? Because they want to keep this as an advantage. You know, I'm I'm of the opinion that you know everyone should benefit from this, and and I I was always I was always fine, you know, having people know my secrets and and know what I was doing because I wanted to I wanted to beat that. I you know I, I figured I was going to beat them anyway. You know, I'm going to work harder than you. I'm going to push myself. I'm going to go harder than you. And like, yeah, I'll tell you what I'm doing ahead of time. You can do the same thing. I'm still going to beat you. So that was always my mentality. But obviously there are others that that sort of want to keep that as an advantage to themselves. But I can tell you now, you know, that if you want that advantage as a young athlete or a mature athlete or in someone who's 86 and going to a nursing home, the best thing that you can do for your life and your health and your athletic performance is eating a biologically appropriate species specific diet and excluding all of the things that are going to be detrimental to your health and performance like plants and carbohydrates in particular. Well, that, that was, uh, that was actually brilliant. And I also got to <laughs> say that when you were talking about growth hormone, I, I was just thinking about sleeping and testosterone is also the hormone. Mm. Of uh, testosterone is the hormone of um, of motivation, and if you're going to be motivated to do something, you have to have high testosterone. E- e- and even in women, it has to be relatively high, not like relative to their level, not relative to a man. Obviously, that yeah. that doesn't that doesn't work. We, you know, we've seen. Yeah, women, women need testosterone too, and men need estrogen. Yeah. You know, I mean, these yeah. these are important hormones, but they they need to be in balance. Yeah. And uh, and they will get out of balance if you eat the wrong thing. And and if you have your growth hormone, if you, if you're eating optimally, then you'll have quality sleep, which is going to help your growth. Absolutely, hormone. That's also going to help your performance. This has been unbelievable. I, I do want to say a couple before before we talk about a couple of little things about you know the cancer stuff. Listen to Doctor for Seafree. There there's a little bit more yeah. to what we were talking about than you know fast and fast and the and the tumors go away. It's yeah, it's, it's not quite that simple. Yeah, and and then uh but the stuff that we've spoken to you about with insulin and anything else i mean anthony has given you a potpourri of information that you can delve in deeper and that's where i'd like to get to now uh dr anthony chafee what do you 
you know, what do you what are you up to? What do you where can people get a hold of you? Um, what recommendations would you have for people as to places to go for information and and things like that? And and how do they how you have a podcast? You you're you're very very active. I mean, I don't know. How to, mm-hmm. I guess I know how you got the energy, but I'm I'm old. So. <laughs> got all the energy i'm really i'm i'm getting my growth hormone i sleep a lot i'm old <laughs> yeah. but I, I tell you i i will say that uh this carnivore diet has been unbelievable after after my next surgery and my second one which was mm. which was very traumatic i i was sleeping 14 to 16 hours a day just to just to recover and now i'm i'm pretty well down to eight to nine and 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 this is it was in the 10 to 11 range before I started doing this, even when I was ketovore. And this has been, this, this is, has really changed my life for the positive. And, and like I said, for me, it's been three and a half months, but it's been about two years of ketovore and, and 20 years yes. of knowing that that's how I should eat, but just didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it, it's a, a little bit about like where people can find you and, 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 yeah what they can learn more about this. Yeah. Theory. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Well, well, thank you very much for having me on. It's, it's a pleasure. It's great. Great talking to you. It's great to, you know, to meet, uh, uh, you know, fellow ruggers who know all the people that I played with and, and who coached me growing up. So that's awesome, uh, to connect. So, uh, yeah, well, people can find me. I, I do have a podcast. It's just called the plant free MD. And so that's sort of, you know, cutting with the theme, uh, keeping with the theme of uh, just not wanting to eat plants whatsoever, and that's on on every podcast uh, platform. It's uh, uh, that that you want, so Apple, Spotify, whatever. And then I have a YouTube channel that's just uh, my name, just Anthony Chafee, MD. So Chafee spelled C H A double F double E, and um, and then you can find all my my videos and and a bunch of other things on there as well. And I specifically have um, well, you can you have the sort of the podcast videos on there as well and just starting from one and going on from there i think that's could be a good way to start but if you want to sort of get a more curated list i have a playlist called carnivore essentials on my youtube channel and i think that has some of the 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 more important videos to to watch and and to know about and there's even ones that talk about you know carnivore for beginners how to get started on a carnivore diet things to to watch out for things to 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 look for uh talking about fiber constipation diet how to figure out if you're getting enough fat and and what to do with your digestion things like that so there's i think uh, and then some faqs ones as well so you know i think that covers 98 99 percent of of the issues that people might run into uh, starting a carnivore diet and how to get started. So that's a good place for people to start. And then a lot of those other videos really give the nuts and bolts on why we're doing this and why it's important. And, you know, a lot of the, the things that we touched on here today would be in there as well, but then sometimes in more focused detail, showing studies and showing, uh, you know, different, you know, uh, different papers and things like that. I always try to put the the papers and the references in the descriptions. If I'm talking about you know specific studies, I try to put those in the description so people can go down there. They can check my work and if they think that hey, you know I think that you got it wrong on this. That's fine, you know. But uh, this is where I'm coming from, and you know this is what I'm basing that. Well, part of the stuff I'm basing it on, um, and uh, and so then I'm on yeah Instagram. Uh, that's the same thing. Just uh, Anthony Chafee MD. And uh, yeah, people can find find me there, and I, I do a lot of posts there, and, and let people know when I'm having podcasts out. So if they want to uh, just yeah, just check me out there. Those are those are where they can find me. And then Twitter Anthony underscore Chafee uh, that I'm trying to become more active in. Is there a, is there a place where if, if people were interested in in having you be their uh, their doctor or or the or the um, for, for lack of a better word, nutritionist, or is there any, or is there anywhere that they can reach you in order to use you as a consult? Or uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it is difficult because yeah, yeah I'm sort you of know, yeah, you're doing your, yeah. your work is kind of your work yeah. is kind of brutal. I don't know that there's a lot of time for that. It, but, it uh, is difficult, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm doing you know neurosurgery full time. That's that's my yeah. day, night, and weekend job, and then on the weekends that I that I do have free i work i work in a private clinic yeah. doing exactly that though because I, I think that it's you know that it's really good to be able to see people on a, on a sort of more one-to-one basis where you're not sort of a critical care sort of uh you know it's more rushed and you have to sort of fly through different yeah. things in a very very hyper specialized field 
uh, like neurosurgery. And um, so I do like that. I, I do like that aspect. I you know, have a clinic here uh, that I work out of called uh, the Hobart Clinic in Mount Hawthorne, which is in Perth, Australia. So obviously not really helpful for people around the world. Um, and I and then I do you know my podcast, I follow videos in, in my other time. I, I do try to do sort of online consultations for people who really need it. But I do try to encourage people to watch my videos and, and try to get their answers there because I don't I don't want people to have to pay for something that they can get for free. I try to make all this stuff available to people for free so that they they can get all the information, they can get everything that they need without having to pay for it. Because the whole idea here is to get away from the medical system and to get away from having to pay people and and medicines and things like that. Just learning how to live uh, health healthily and and you know and not having to need that. There are some people with very specific situations that they need a bit more uh, you know, uh, TLC. help with. Yeah, exactly. And, and for those people, I do try to make myself available. Um, but I, I do try to encourage people is like watch my videos first and, and, you know, sort of, sort of answer all those questions first. And if there's more than I can help with, we can try to help, help that out. Um, I do have contact information in my, I, I do have an email that if people are interested in, or in, in collaborating or doing something or, uh, need a bit of help. I mean, obviously, I can't answer medical questions over email or anything like that, um, uh, or at all, really. You know, it's just outside of you know the bounds of practice. But um, my email is just Anthony uh, at gmail dot com, and so that's A N T H O N Y C H A F F E E at gmail dot com, and people can. Uh, go there if they if they have seen my videos, they watch these things, and they really feel that they need more. Um, then we can we can see about that uh, about doing more. But um, or if people wanted to collaborate or do uh, podcasts or interviews or or whatever, or maybe uh, somebody who is feeling a bit uh, rebellious in the in the rugby community and wanted to get their team on a carnivore diet to actually uh, dominate the competition, I'm 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 definitely here for that. I would, I want to say thank you very much. This was fabulous and a fabulous experience. And I, and Rizzoni said you were a man. I mean, he's not going to like hearing about the mushrooms being carcinogenic. I know. I was, yeah, I was, I was thinking about him as well. (laughs) uh, I mean, the guy lives for having, I don't even know if he likes eating them, but he likes to go out and catch them. We'll go out and find them. I'm sure he likes eating them too. Not a lot that he doesn't put in his body these days. Um, (laughs) That all, uh, that all said, that was now. There's gonna you'll have some things. Do you have carnivore on a budget? Like because there's gonna be guys. I'm broke. Yeah. I can't afford meat. Yeah. So there's carnivore on a budget. This way, there's plenty of ways to afford this. And and you don't you're not eating all that shit. So that's it. You, you're taking all that crap out of your. You know you're not paying two fifty for a Gatorade anymore. You're just no, and you're not water out yeah, or, or six bucks for free. Yeah, six bucks for a Starbucks or something like yeah. that. I mean, ground beef is cheap as hell. Right, yeah. and it has all the nutrients you need for 24 hours. Right, okay. so I'm, I'm children. Yeah, so okay. I'm, I'm take children. Yeah, that's it. That's it. You know, so you know, I'm I'm like 240 pounds. Like I on a sedentary day, I eat like two pounds of beef, fatty beef. Fattier the better. If fatty, you're going to get more nutrients, and more calories. You'll you'll have you'll actually eat less pounds. So the fattier the meat that you get, the less you'll have to eat, the less you'll have to pay. All right. And um, ground beef is, is super cheap anywhere, anywhere you go generally. And um, but even steak is less expensive than spinach, depending on the cut. Right. So if you look at like per pound, right, yeah. like a pound of spinach costs more than than steak does unless you get a very, very fancy cut. So, you know, and, and potato chips, exactly the same it costs more than steak. So, you know, you actually find that you you spend less and you get a lot more and you know you can't put a price tag on your health and you know but you know down the road you can you know all the different medications all the different appointments all the surgeries all just the the, just the lost days of your life that you're not going to get back and um and just your performance and in every aspect of your life you're going to be doing better you're going to be feeling better you know people is something we didn't touch on but mental health disorders this is shown uh, from uh, professor chris palmer at harvard that you can reverse 
you know, serious mental health disorders like major depression, anxiety, schizophrenia. He's reversing schizophrenia with a ketogenic or carnivore diet. He's actually done carnivore himself. Professor Palmer has, and he does more more keto now. But you know, that's something. He's just like, yeah, that's a that's a keto diet. Then you know, the main thing is mitochondrial health. So we're seeing that more and more and more that that the mitochondria are really important for all these disease processes. So you know, it's it's much time. cheaper. Than that. One last. Sorry. One last. Yeah. Thing. A lot of people are going to say, but my doctor said this, mm-hmm. X, Y, Z. How much training does a doctor get in nutrition? And are they just reading or are they just repeating the shit that they hear on TV? And I don't know if they're allowed to do uh, drug ads in Australia. I know they're allowed in New Zealand mm-hmm. and America. And... It's like people are going in, uh, my cholesterol. I, mean, I think Dr. Ken yeah. Berry did something where cholesterol is like the 13th or 14th leading. Yeah, that's factor. Yeah. It's like almost nothing in the heart disease. Like, So you're by going to Dr. Anthony Chafee's channel, mm-hmm. you will be armed with the information to be able to dispute your doctor in a sensible way. He may not be able to accept what you say based on insurance guidelines or standard of care practice, he, he may even agree with you and not be able to say that you're correct. Can you just Hmm. elaborate a little bit on, you know, some, you know, there might've been something that happened recently that, that some doctors may disagree with mandating something that might've come out, that everybody needed to get that was so great for you now more people are yeah. having terrible <laughs> and whatever that uh you know has really wreaked massive havoc on us so it, could you just ease people into saying hey don't sweat it man that like so sorry you know you know what i'm asking yeah. not not about that yeah, no, i'm not asking about this no, no. thing I, i'm asking about that the doctor doesn't really know no, as much about nutrition as he may let on or she may. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, that's the thing, you know, it's like the, the exact amount of, of time that we got learning nutrition is, is that much zero. We didn't get anything uh, really done. Maybe some, some biochemistry stuff you could call and, that and, nutrition. And, and you went to a PAC 12 school you went to, and, and so you went to a high, high caliber university and you went to the Royal mm-hmm. College of Surgeons in London. So you're not, you're not a poorly educated man. You, you got that much. Z- no, I, I hope not. Yeah, I, I, I do my best anyway. Oh, and and you're uh, very well educated, and and they taught you zero. You had to learn this. This is this is you. Yeah. Well, and you and I, I mean, I took nutrition classes in college because I was interested in it. You know, I was I was interested. I wanted to fuel my body with with the the best thing that I could. You know, I I was an athlete. I wanted to I wanted to be the best athlete that I could, and so I took nutrition classes. I was also interested in biology, and so this was just a natural uh, path for me. Uh, in medical school, I mean, yeah, there's some biochemistry that we learn, and yeah, you learn a bit about you know cholesterol and how that works in your body, and and, uh, and you're eating fructose and how that's metabolized. So that's 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 that that is nutrition. You know, biochemistry is nutrition, but you know, the fact of the matter is is that even nutritionists don't know nutrition because they know the nutrition that's taught to them by the propagandists that's paid for by the big food companies. You know. Coca-Cola, just Coca-Cola, not Kellogg's and Pepsi and Nestle and all the others, just Coca-Cola, spend 11 times the amount of money on nutritional research than the NIH, okay? So the nutritional research that's out there is crap. This is industry research. This is propaganda. And, you know, the, a lot of this stuff from, like, Loma Linda and the Seventh-day Adventists and things like that, we already know their bias. They founded nutritional sciences. They have... They had their grubby little fingers in uh, uh, university nutrition since the outset, and they are absolutely still involved. Do not kid yourself for a second to think that that has gone away and this is a you know wonderfully pure scientific endeavor. It is not. It is pure propaganda. And so I'm actually happy that doctors don't get taught nutrition because they would have been taught propaganda. They would have been taught this plant-based nonsense that is just is just factually incorrect. So I'm actually glad that we don't get taught that, but we don't get taught that. And so when people, when, when, when I, and I, I, I 
saw this phenomenon in myself and in, in others in my class where, you know, you all of a sudden you're becoming a, you're learning to become a doctor and then become a doctor. And then someone says something about you. Oh, well, yes, this is what it is. It has something to do with health. You're, you are now a certified health expert. Right? And so whatever your opinions and bias were, yeah, whatever your opinions and bias were before that, you just go, oh, yeah, no, 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 that, that's, a, that's what that is. You speak very authoritatively because you're a doctor and, and, you are, and you're a health expert, right? And I remember catching myself a few times. I'm like, I don't actually know that. Like, I, 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 that's my opinion, this and the other, but I was like, I should actually look that up. Because like I'm, I'm doing it, and I would see my peers doing this. Now you, you see doctors doing this all the time. I've spoken to different doctors, and they're like, "Well, the reason that people are so fat and sick is because they don't listen to the doctor's advice. They're just they're just eating too much fat and this and the other." That's not true. If you look at the consumption data that we brushed on uh, brushed on earlier, we reduced red meat by thirty percent, over thirty three percent, in fact, reduced fat and cholesterol by thirty percent. Right? Things got worse. So people listened. They did listen. And started eating more whole food, more fruits and vegetables, start, started eating less meat, less fat, saturated fat, I should say, because they started replacing it with seed oils, which are poison. And, you know, and, and everyone got worse. So, no, the problem was they did listen to their doctors. They did listen to the nutritional guidelines and everyone got worse. So, you know, like you said, you know, arm yourself with the facts. No, no. And that's why I put uh, that's why I put a lot of um, uh, resources and links to studies and other talks and lectures in my in my talks because I think it's very very important to know the sources and, and have these on your arsenal. I've got I've got hundreds of studies on my phone, and someone goes, "Oh well, where did you hear that? Oh, here you go. Here's five studies. There you go. You know, like this is this is important to know about. And when you arm yourself with the facts and you just understand what's going on, your doctor says, "Oh no no, you shouldn't be doing that." Well. You can push back on them if you want, or you can just avoid it and just be like, well, you know, this is what I'm doing. You don't even have to bring it up. Why bring it up? You know, you don't need to, right? And so, you know, it's just, you know, you, you just get to do what you want to do. And that's something that I that we've learned in the last couple of years, as you alluded to, you know, your body is your own. You get to decide what happens to it. You know, you do not have to take any medications that you don't want to take. You do not have to do any interventions that you don't want to do. That is the law. And that is international law that is, that is encoded and enshrined in the Nuremberg Code. And anyone who violates that is violating the Nuremberg Code and, and, and is doing the same thing that the Nazis did, you know. And so you don't have to do anything you damn well don't want to. And if your doctor wants to put you on a medication and you feel that you have, and you have researched this to an extent that you say, you know what, I actually don't want to take that medication – you do not have to take that medication and you should not feel pressured or influenced by your doctor to say, well, you know, you have to do this because I'm a doctor. Well, that's, that's a very bad take as a doctor. That's bad bedside manner. You know, if I have a patient that I want to try, and I think that something's going to really help them, and I say, I think this is the right thing to do. It's still their body at the end of the day. You know, if I think surgery is really going to help them, it's their body. They have to go through it. They're running the risk. They have to do the recovery. Right. And so if they said, you know what, I really don't want to do that. I don't think that's the right thing for me right now. I just want to wait and see. I'm, I'm, all, I'm going to be in their corner, you know, and if your doctor's not in your corner, that could be a problem. That could be a sign that, you know, maybe, maybe they're not there for you in other ways. And so arm yourself with the facts, know what's going on, know the studies, know the arguments on both sides. You know, listen to the vegans, listen to you know, these people. There's tons of nutritionists that have, that have learned the plant-based way of eating, saw it, you know, destroy their own health, saw it destroy their patient's health, and went like, this is wrong. And they had to relearn everything, and now they're on a carnivore side or a keto side. Um, and so, you know, there are plenty of resources out there. There are plenty of, uh, you know, contrarians to the norm who have a lot of evidence and uh, behind us. And so... Just take a look. I mean, that's why I made my channel was to provide people with that information and that access to these things that not everyone's gonna gonna see. I've, I've spent years looking at these things. I've, you know, of course, in my education, decades, you know, and I've come across things that I think add. And so I've I've tried to lay those out in a systematic way to allow people to uh, to have access to. And you just learn that and you understand that. You're going to be much better armed going in and, hey, maybe you can convince your own doctor 
uh, that this is, a, this is a better idea for their patients. And you will see your numbers improve, your health improve. And if your doctor can't see that, can't recognize that you are getting better, you're coming off medications, your blood pressure is down, you're off your diabetes medication, your HbA1c is back to normal, your testosterone's up, you know, all these other markers are improving. And then you say, oh, but your LDL is up, so you gotta stop this right away. And that's insanity, right? You've, you know, you've improved your health by all these different, different metrics. And yet, you know, someone gets hung up on that one little figure. That's 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 uh, that's insanity to me. So understand what the hell is going on with cholesterol, and um, and and arm yourself with these facts. I have a video called "The Truth About Cholesterol and Heart Disease." It's very simple, and it just goes through the history, goes through the facts, goes through the science, and it has the resources there available for you. Leading the way in. But two of the most prominent ones are rugby guys. You and Dr. Sean Baker are uh, true. Are the, yeah, the are the most prominent, and and Dr. Ken Berry, but I don't think he played rugby. Are the most prominent. No, he played uh, basketball. Did yeah. he? So there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was a he was a yeah scholarship basketball player, and then he blew out his knee. Oh well, there you go. Then that's uh, they. So you you're looking at at people who are into high performance. And when people are into high performance, you you have there there's every little bit counts. Like yeah, what that little one percent here, that little one percent there. Your mental game, your everything counts. And nutrition is really not not taken the proper way. I don't think. Mm-hmm. And and if people took their nutrition properly, they'd. They probably, as you said, they wouldn't get sore. The inflammation, and we're causing our own inflammation. And when you're yeah. causing your own inflammation, you're just fucking up your recovery dreadfully. Yeah, so, absolutely. Thank you very much. I have unfortunately lived a lifetime of of inflammation, but uh, but hopefully the the next generation of people can can be more like you and 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 really find their way into a uh, into a great lifestyle. Thank you very much, Dr. Anthony Chafee. This was absolutely brilliant. You want to man. Well, thank you. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. All right, brother. Perfect. Let me just cut the recording. Oh, have a great day, everybody, and thank you, and, and goodbye. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, Now it's just, I think it always just gives me the option to leave, so I won't Thank you again. I appreciate it. No Thanks, and uh, I know it's probably getting a little bit late by you, but I don't know if you're going out or if you're gonna if you're gonna uh, get up and go. No, to work. I'll stay in. I got. Um, I don't think I've got um, anything else tonight. No, I've just I've just got some meetings and stuff like that in the morning. So I'm just yeah. gonna take it easy. Good. Yeah. I'm gonna watch some rugby today, and that'll be it for me. So nice. Anyway, have a good one. Have a great day, brother. Peace. Great. Optimal diets. You know, maybe some people you know, can be uh, less damaged, have more defenses towards some of these plant poisons and plant toxins. But that doesn't mean it's, it's optimal for them. That doesn't mean that it's the best thing that they can have. So there is an optimal diet, okay? It is something, all right? So I think all the best evidence shows that, that that's a carnivore diet. And so regardless of your age, regardless of your issue and your disease, that is the best thing for you to eat. And it will change your life dramatically.